So we should select uh, the device and the uh, balloon adjusting to these components. And uh, so we should know the vascular branch law very well. To the current, rail, uh, current day, these uh, four kind of the vascular branch laws uh, ha have been uh, proposed. Among them, uh, Finner's law is a standard vascular branching law. It is based on the insight from the angiography analysis in normal coronary artery. The fractal ratio defined as the daughter uh, diameter of mother vessel to the sum of the daughter vessel diameters are stable at 0.67a. Four years ago, I investigated the QC reference diameter fractal ratio in the previous bifurcation study. Uh, the uh, left uh, right panel shows the, uh, the fractal ratio of the QC reference does not reach to the 0.678 even after PCI. Sorry, it doesn't work. So oh, I investigate the reference diameter derived from the IBUS. Uh, here you can see mean value of the fractal ratio is uh, 0 0.676. It is very close to uh, Finet's law. Uh, therefore, when you use the Finet's law in the bifurcation region, reference diameter should be obtained by imaging, not by angiography, especially uh, pot balloon selection. In terms of the balloon selection for kissing balloon inflation, area preservation law is useful. Two balloons dilated area is assumed to be preserved in the proximal membrane and also assumed to be uh, down to round shape like this. This formula is introduced. Uh, we call this formula a Mitchell formula named after first proposer, our great mentor, Dr. Mitchell. I investigated whether uh, Mitchell's law accurately uh, estimates the uh, dilated area proximal member cell. Uh, we select uh, uh, cases, 55 cases, uh, with crossover stenting uh, followed by kissing by the impression without pot in the 3D OCT bifurcation registry. That means the proximal member cell is only dilated by kissing by inflation. Here you can see there is a positive correlation between the theoretical diameter and the actual mean diameter. Uh, okay. And uh, Finner's law, uh, that so uh, I also investigate uh, the uh, whether Finner's law uh, is applicable for this purpose. Uh, the uh, here you can see uh, Finner's law also has a positive correlation uh, between them. Uh, so both formula are available for predicting the proximal member cell diameter, uh, dilated diameter. However, actual dilated uh, diameter is smaller than the predicted value in the middle formula uh, around 80%. Uh, we should know the maximum stent expansion capacity uh, in the current uh, generation DS platform. Uh, this is a case of uh, LM size of 5 mm, LED seem to be 3 mm. If we choose the 3.0 meter stent for this uh, uh, LM bifurcation, crossover stenting, uh, it is small uh, because of the, uh, it is not allowed for the 5 meter left main uh, inflation. So in such case, we should choose a 3.5 millimeter stent for this region. And in the eliminatory stent under expansion presented in 59%, uh, uh, the more frequent under expansion uh, existed in this study, uh, one of the reasons is the assumption of the vessel tapering, like vessel gradual uh, tapering. However, actually, vessel uh, tapering occurred at the branching point, so we should set the new uh, reference diameter uh, distal side of the uh, vessel. So uh, according to this theory, a uh, minimum expansion index is uh, proposed newly a volumetric analysis obtained by creating an ideal lumen profile considering vessel tapering and branching using four Kassel model. 
uh, the Abbott uh, new machine launched uh, this uh, function, uh, AppView uh, software uh, uh, showed uh, the stent expansion index in the middle panel. Uh, here you can see minimal stent area showed as uh, uh, this uh, part. However, uh, the stent expansion index is 89%. Uh, so uh, this is satisfactory expansion. This is, a this is not the target uh, for the post balloon dilation. Previously, we regarded to this type. However, uh, new target is the minimum expansion index area, uh, indicated the red zone. Expansion is 67%. Uh, Lumen area is almost satisfactory for the MSA criteria, 4.4 millimeter square. Uh, so we should dilate this site uh, more over, uh, more uh, larger balloon. Uh, in the site. So a post balloon target changed from the MSA site to MEI site. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my take home message. Uh, device sizing in generally ear based reference diameter measurement is partially recommended. In case of a visible uh, ER, lumen based measurement is also available. For the optimal stand zone, landing zone, it is important to avoid dissection, uh, more than 50% plug button, and repeat flow. Uh, device sizing for bifurcation region, uh, pot and the kiss balloon inflation balloon should be selected according to the vascular branching law. In the bifurcation region, uh, finesse law is applicable for imaging guide reference diameter measurement, not for angio based one. Stent should be selected considering maximal stent expansion capacity. Uh, minimum expansion index uh, considering vascular branching and tapering is more physiological to select post dilation site and appropriate balloon. Thank you for attention. Okay, thank you very much. A burning question from the panel of the chairman for the uh, speaker. Uh, I have one in uh, the people are thinking when your conclusion is applicable for intravascular imaging in general, yes, but in aluminum it's clear that they propose to use on OCT the reference diameter. That means the external uh, luminate. And you have to go quite far in a healthy tissue to be able to see that with the uh, OCT. While in with the IVUS, they said plug burden below less than 50, I'm satisfied to uh, finish my stand. When you look at these two, type of approach, is there a basic difference in length of stenting? Because it seems to me that if you have to look on OCT on an almost healthy tissue so that you are able to see the external elastic laminae, you are going to put a longer stent than with IVUS. Any idea about that? Uh, according to the uh, opinion trial, there's no old, uh, significant difference uh, in the stent length. Uh, so our opinion trial, we uh, recommend the lumen-based uh, stent, uh, stent size selection. Uh, so uh, it co uh, resulted in the smaller stent sizing. However, length is almost the same. Uh, so all the we searched is the uh, reference site which shows the uh, uh, EL side query side or uh, plug button is uh, less than uh, 50 percent uh, we guess so uh, stent length is not so problem stent size is the lumen based one is uh, provides a relatively smaller one but clinical event is the same as uh, IBAS guidance and the uh, OCT guidance. The result is uh, quite the same as the uh, element three. With your formula, the intercept is very good compared mm. to the Finet. I think it was 157, while Finet was something like uh, 0 0.60. Is that correct? Uh, uh, the intercept of the slope, your formula versus the formula of Finet. Uh, 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 Calculating the proximal member cell difference diameter. Cal calculating, looking at the intercept. The slope was okay, but the intercept was quite different. But yeah. it's okay. It's just uh, mm. I was puzzled. Yes. Uh, in the Illumin 4, they have taken 90% expansion. 
and that is calculated at the MSA. Yeah. Now in this new software that you showed, how is the expansion index different from the MSA? Uh, expansion index uh, calculated by the new stated uh, reference diameter. So reference diameter should be set at the branching point. This side, the uh, bus uh, side branch enter into here. So according to the flow cutoff model, a uh, new reference diameter set it uh, distal side of the branching point. So uh, compared to the minimum stent area concept, the uh, uh, as I showed in the last case, the uh, you treat the minimum stent area uh, in the pre previously. However, uh, in the concept of minimum uh, expansion index concept, uh, that is the expansion is enough. So oh, uh, minimal expansion index is more physiological expansion. So MSA is taken for from branch point to branch point to branch yes, point? Yes, yes, change the, the each point. Short question, uh, short, short response. Yeah, short uh, practical question. When you position your the edge of the stand in the intermediate class by bus, say between 40, 50 percent, how do you size the stand according to lumen, media to media, pathway? What is your policy? People are asking this question frequently. Mm. Uh, according to our uh, daily practice, uh, lumen-based uh, stent size selection, because uh, more complex region included in, in the daily practice. Uh, if uh, we can see the clearly in the ear size, we decide the ear best. Okay. We move for the next presentation. It's a pleasure to, pr to introduce to Nieves Gonzalo. This is a very active researcher in Spain. Uh, she is going to, to speak about plaque characteristi characteristics in bifurcation leasing, efficient strategy making by intraconary imaging. Good, Nieves. Good morning, and first of all, thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to give this uh, presentation. Um, so these are all the types of information that we can gain from intracoronary imaging when treating um, bifurcation lesions. So we, we can have information about the plaque characteristics, distribution, we can uh, use it, of course, to size our stents, uh, or for rewiring and stent uh, optimization. In this talk, I'm gonna focus on these two aspects. First of all, uh, uh, plaque characteristics and lesion preparation and plaque distribution to select the uh, stent bifurcation technique. Uh, we all know that uh, Intracoronary imaging can distinguish different types of plaques. These are examples of the same plaques, uh, corresponding images with IBUS and OCT. You can see in the left panel a fibrous plaque. In the mid uh, panel, we have a calcified uh, plaque. On the right panel, you can see a liquidic plaque in IBUS and OCT. Of course, the most relevant um, uh, type of plaques for our interventions is calcium. And we know that angiography uh, is not excellent for determining the distribution of calcium, intracoronary imaging is much better in this regard. Both IBUS and OCT are very sensitive to the tested presence of calcium. In the case of IBUS, of course, calcium induced shadow. This uh, doesn't happen in OCT. So with OCT, we can uh, actually assess uh, the thickness of the calcium. And this is the difference between the two techniques. And of course, the detection of calcium is important because when there's a lot of calcium, we can have extent under expansion, especially if we have some uh, uh, type of calcification like the one I'm showing here with the grain of calcium. This is again corresponding images in the same lesion with IBUS on the left panel and OCT on the right. You can see that again with both techniques we can see that there is a grain of calcium but with OCT we get more details about the thickness uh, of the calcium that are not visible in IBUS because of the shadow. And actually there has been um, several reports trying to de uh, determine scores to say, uh, to say in which situations we have the risk of under expansion and in, which, in which situations we should make sure that we prepare properly the plaque. This is uh, one OCT score that has been proposed in general. The idea is if the calcium, if the calcium is thick, it, it extends uh, circumferentially more than 180 degrees, and if it extends longitudinally, then you have a uh, risk of under expansion and you should make sure that you prepare properly your lesion, otherwise you can have under expansion, and we all know that this is a very difficult problem to solve when you are in front of your stand. 
Um, and of course, um, it's not only important to determine that you need to prepare your plug, but it's also very important to check that you have properly prepared your plug. Sometimes you can do plug preparation, but uh, sometimes you don't achieve the uh, result you want. You really don't break the capsule, and um, you need to make sure that you have achieved uh, this uh, uh, good result before implanting the stand. Um, and you can do that also with OCT. Here we have examples of the effect you have on the plug with rotational telectomy or with hydrectomy. In the down panel, you can see this um, the effect of IDL, little twisty, which is uh, fractures of the calcium. So make sure that your plug preparation has been actually good before implanting the stent, especially in the lead calcium type base of calcium. And the second part of the talk is about the plug distribution and how can we use this to select our bifurcation uh, strategy. Um, first of all, it can help us to select the stent technique, traditional versus two stents, because of course the Timogen read can clarify very well the side branch involvement. Uh, it can be also useful to evaluate the result uh, in traditional uh, of the side branch in, in provisional. Sometimes we are uh, we are doing provisional, we have doubts about how is the result in the side branch, and imaging can help us in these cases. And finally, if we're going to use the two stand technique, imaging is also useful to select uh, which one, depending on the size of the main branch and side branch, the plug distribution and barbing in each branch, also location of the plug distribution, which is a very, very relevant point, I think, to decide about the technique and also the landing zones uh, side. And I'm going to try to show you this with a few examples. This is uh, a patient with 53 year old in China, a positive exercise test. And as you can see, he has this distal left main lesion. This is an OCT pullback from the LED. And as you can see, he has uh, this involvement of the ostial LED. You can see uh, there that there is a fibrous plug, a lumen that is uh, significantly reduced. You can also see on the uh, panels on the um, left and right the reference in the distal LED and in the left main. So no doubt about the involvement of the ostial LED. What about the surge? By angiography, it's difficult to know if there is a uh, real involvement of this side branch. When we measure it with OCT, we can see that there is plaque at this level, but the, um, the size uh, of the lumen is quite big. It's almost 80 millimeter. So based on that, in this case, we decided to do it provisional. So we implanted the stand, uh, as you can see, from the LED uh, to the left main. And um, uh, after that, we, uh, of course, did the board, rewire, uh, perform a kissing, and this is the result. And now we are not really happy, of course, about the result of the ostium of the surge. We want to check what happened there. And if you do an OCT now, well, you can see that actually there is a dissection in the ostium of the surge that is actually uh, creating this pinching that you can see in angiography. And of course, we thought we needed to fix that, so we reconverted it to CAP. And um, this is the final result that you can see on the right panel after uh, CAP. So it's a case where, first of all, we decided to do provisional based on imaging, but we also uh, used imaging to assess uh, the result in the side branch that was not optimal by angiography. Um, another example, this is an old man, an 85-year-old man coming with progressive angina. And uh, you can see here in this uh, moving image that he has a lot of disease uh, involving the left main, but also um, but also the uh, left main and the LED. And of course, the decision here is how to treat that. And um, for that, we use imaging. In this case, IVUS. You can see in IVUS that we have this severely calcified stenosis in the distal uh, left main, but there is no drain of calcium. So probably we can treat that uh, uh, with uh, just balloon uh, dilatations. It's important to assess also how is the involvement of the, of the ostiums. And you can see that actually both, is, uh, both vessels, LAD and surge, are involved. It's interesting, the distribution of the calcium. We have more circular calcium in the ostial surge than in the ostial LED, probably more plaque in the LED, but less calcified. And based on that, of course, we thought we needed a two-stand technique. And given also the distribution of the calcium, we thought it would be easier probably to try to implant our first stand towards the surge. Um, the second point we need to check, of course, is the landing zones to decide about the technique. This is the left main, which is very, uh, is very big, as you, can, as you can see, five millimeters. And if you look at the reference, the reference in the LED was almost four. Reference in the surge was smaller. So based on that, uh, we decided in this case to do a little cross. And I'm going to go very uh, quickly with the steps that we all, of course, know. 
uh, low, we have these mid, uh, uh, well, mostly three day later when uh, black preparation was performed with a scoring balloon, especially to treat this falsified lesion in the ostium cert. This is a stent implanted in the mid cert, then a stent from the proximal cert to a left main, um, crossing of the uh, stent, rewiring, first teasing, second stent from the LAD to the left main, then the port, new rewiring, second teasing, final port, and this is the final uh, result. And as you can see, it uh, was, uh, was okay. Uh, so again, a case in which distribution, location of the calcification was important to select the technique. And just to finish this um, final case, again, an old man coming with and China and this uh, distal left main stenosis, as you can see here in these two uh, images. It looks by angiography like both vessels are involved. Probably we'll go uh, already to a two-cent technique, but we can assess this, of course, with imaging. Again, we can see that the distal left main is involved and also the mid cert, uh, the mid left main, but no, uh, there's some calcium, but not really circumferential calcification. calcification. The ostiums, again, both, both involved, uh, both the ostium cert and LED, two-cent technique needed. And now, which technique? Well, if we look at the references in this case, there is a large discordance in vessel size. We have a reference in the cert which is much higher, it's almost four millimeter, while the LED was a smaller vessel. The reference was only three millimeters. So based on that, we decided to do a tap and actually implant a stent from the cert to LF main and do a tap in the LED. And this is what we did. And then very fast through the procedure. Again, we can see pre dilatations, a stent from the cert to the left and a main the port. And this is the opening towards the LED and the final tap, and I'm showing you here the final uh, result. So just to conclude for messages, intracoronary imaging is useful to determine the plaque composition and confirm also an adequate plaque preparation. And information regarding plaque distribution, calcium location, and vessel size can be used to select a bifurcation stent with a port. Thank you. Thank you, Nieves. You always show m very beautiful image uh, of a calcified plaque by OCT. I, I impressed, but uh, when w in the clinical practice, when you try to to obtain this image, in how many cases do you fail to cross the OCT catheter? Because calcified plaque sometimes di uh, are difficult to 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 to. to to, to cross and, and to, to obtain the, 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 the good image. Yeah, that, that's true. I mean, sometimes if it's very calcified, the, the catheter won't cross. I would say that usually what, make, what makes it more difficult is when you have a combination of, of, of curves and calcium. Generally, if it's a more straight lesion, unless it is very tight, generally the catheter will cross. If you have, for example, in the cert, it's more complex because usually you have the problem of the, the, buff, no, the, the curve and the calcium, and then usually the catheter collapses and it's more difficult. But I think, I mean, in these cases, if the catheter doesn't cross, as it was said in the old times, then maybe um, what you need to do is just predilate a little bit, make sure that you can uh, at least uh, go there with the catheter, and make sure then if you need more plaque preparation, or the, if you can just do it with predilatation. If the catheter doesn't cross, then you need to predilate that sure, the surely. A question from the panel. Or yeah. What's your uh, algorithm to, to decide on different, you know, uh, even preparation strategies? I mean. Balloon uh, predilatation, republation, shock case, uh, intercrypting. Uh, is imaging helpful to take this decision? Or I think we are in the process of learning uh, with techniques that are appearing now, like shock wave, for example, because one thing that looks um, quite clear from the cases we have been uh, doing is that the, um, there are different types of calcium, and the effect of the different techniques on the different types of calcium is different. It's not the same having a ring of calcium. Uh, than having a calcified nodule. So uh, I think we are in the process really of learning um, which technique is better for which type of calcification. I don't think there is an algorithm already established for that, but I think we're gonna, we are in the process of learning and clearly the effect of the different techniques on the different types of calcium is, is different. Very short question. Uh, you, sh you show example of uh, rotoblator, orbital, a little clipsy, and, and any preference today in one shot? Your favorable. <laughs> I think. The, I think. The, I mean. I, th I think it depends on the on the case, and uh, it depends on the type of calcium. But I think they are all useful, and probably uh, we will need all the techniques for different cases. 
very <laughs> diplomatic, huh? Professor. <laughs> For the time being, the flair of the clinician. There's no rule, but I'm sure there will be some trial, oscillator versus orbital versus should be, should be. Hopefully, hopefully. We'll, we'll keep busy. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nedes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalo. And let me invite uh, Dr. Nagoshi. He is going to speak to us on imaging guided rewiring in bifurcation, 2D and 3D OCT. Thank you, Dr. Mashi. Uh, today, I'd like to I'd like to talk about the one of the results in the 3D OCT bifurcation registry. In the registry, we compared the discard rewiring rate uh, between under the 2D OCT guidance and the 3D OCT guidance. Uh, there are some different curves uh, after crossover standing over side branch orifice. The third choice in the rewiring is very important. As we know, uh, this car rewiring provides the better scaffolding of the side branch orifice. So it's very important to understand the guide wire rewiring, rewiring position correctly. Dr. Okamura revealed, revealed, uh, reported that the 3D OCT is very useful for that purpose. I saw an uh, uh, example case. Not me, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, it uh, it's very difficult for me to assess the uh, guide wire rewiring position only with 3D OCT image. However, 3D image uh, 3D image can reveal the rewiring position very clearly like this. Uh, this is the proximal rewiring and the distal rewiring. So uh, we assess the impact of the 3D OCT on the procedure for bifurcation standing in the registry. Uh, in the registry, we had two, uh, two groups, 3D OCT guide group and the 3D OCT guide group. Only in the 3D OCT guide group, uh, we could refer to the 3D image on site. Uh, this is the definition of the distal, uh, distal cell. Uh, distal cell was de defined as any space enclosed by the carina and the stent strut. And we also classified the gearing configuration into the two patterns. Uh, the, uh, the link free type with no link over carina and the link connecting type uh, with the link of on the carina, like connecting carina and the stent strut. In the characteristic, uh, LM bifurcation region, region is more frequent in the 3D group, and the vessel, uh, vessel size and the uh, bifurcation angle were larger in the 3D group. And the uh, rate of the port was uh, more frequ frequently performed in the 3D group. This star guide wire rewiring rate is significantly higher uh, in the 3D guide group and uh, uh, particularly in link-free type, uh, this style guide wire rewiring was attained in all cases in the 3D guidance. And uh, among 55 3D guidance group, uh, 24, uh, the guide wire rewiring was repeated in 24 cases. Among the 24 cases, uh, after checking the 3D OCT image, the rewiring position was changed from the proximal to the distal in 30 cases, the far distal to the distal in one, the distal to the proximal in four cases. Uh, this is the representative of the uh, proximal to the distal cases in link free type. At first, uh, the guide wire was re uh, rewired in the proximal cell, both prospectus, and uh, after checking the 3D image, uh, we tried to rewire into the distal optimal cell. And uh, you can see the excellent stent strut opening of a side branch orifice. So we think it's important to rewire into the distal cell in the link free type. Uh, this is the link connecting type. Uh, when the uh, stent link divides the distal cell into two parts, I think it's very important to rewire into the uh, distal large, larger cell. So upper picture shows the uh, excellent stent start opening. However, 
draw a picture, you can see the guide wire was rewired into the discal small tires, so uh, the set strut was remained even after fixing barrel inflation. I think uh, uh, the most difficult situation uh, is, th is that the scent link is located at the middle, uh, at around the middle on the carina. Uh, as you can see here in the upper picture, uh, you can see the uh, scent, uh, scent strut severe deformation after kissing balloon inflation, even with the distal rewiring. So after this, uh, after such experience, uh, in such a situation, the link located at the middle of Kaina, uh, we tried to uh, rewire into the proximal, proximal tail in the lower picture. So you can see the weld strut remaining even after kissing balloon inflation, which is better. Mm, uh, recently, uh, in such a situation, uh, we performed balloon twist technique. Uh, I presented the technique uh, in 2017 uh, European Balloon Club meeting. So you can see the, uh, this is the Eden bifurcation case. You can see the 3D OCT image reveals the scent link uh, lo located around the middle of the carina. So uh, we intentionally rewired into the uh, proximal tail. And the okay, let's move on. Uh, in the uh, this is the balloon push technique. Uh, dilated balloon was pushed towards the left circumflex orifice with the Balloon, uh, uh, balloon uh, anchored in the LAB. And kissing was followed. This is the final angiogram and the 3D OCT image. You can see the gel strut uh, was moved towards the distal direction by this technique. Uh, this is my summary. The rate of the distal guide wire rewiring can be higher by referring to the 3D image than only with the 2D image. The scent link location of a side plant orifice is very important. The optimal guide wire rewiring position may depend on the scent link location of a carina. In the link connecting type, it is better to consider the difference of the guide wire rewiring position and uh, in, in not only the longitudinal but also the short axis direction. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nagoshi, for this excellent images. Now, uh, for this, you need the software, and you have been using a uh, uh, yes. custom-built software, yes, not yes. the software that is supported by the industry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, at that time, we used the uh, dedicated, so dedicated software of Intel Bearing, but uh, recently, as uh, as you presented, uh, we don't we didn't use the software. We only used the Abbott 3D image and the Terran 3D image. And uh, how much percent of patients ha uh, have you not been able to decide whether you should go proximally or distally? <laughs> I think uh, mm, only the scent link located ala um, around the, the middle of the carina in LM bifurcation. In such a situation, uh, we correct the guide wire dividing into the proximal. I think that uh, one basic remark that we have to do, I mean, I remember when uh, Takao Kamura in our lab uh, showed the first picture, I was really uh, impressed by what has been achieved. But obviously, each uh, platform of stand requires different uh, strategy. That's the first point. So you have to individualize your uh, approach of the cell with the guide wire according to the shape and uh, the platform of the stand. And that's a major challenge. But on the other hand, if you take, if you talk to the engineer and show this picture, they can very easily pre-program what will be the best place to dilate it. So I think that the next step in the uh, algorithm uh, uh, program will be which cell has to mm -hmm. be uh, uh, dilated being in a cell. It's quite predictable. I mean, it's a little bit the type of work which was done by uh, Phaeops for the valve. I mean, uh, where do you put the valve? And in this case, do they have a, a paravalve uh, leakage? So I think it's something that uh, we should keep.
push the industry to have within seconds, is that the right cell to be violated? Because mm -hmm. the human judgment is sometimes uh, quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your excellent opinion. And, and, and do you use the or do you recommend the use of OCT for the routine clinical practice in order to assess the the, the widening of the cyberan? Because if you do, I, I think that if you perform a, an OCT, you are wrong. You 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 repeat the rewiring, you repeat the <laughs> OCT, you may fail. So you can transform a very simple procedure that can finish with a simple kissing balloon in a very complex and long procedure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we usually repeat it to the buyer <laughs> in, uh, by after getting uh, uh, optimal device, uh, optimal cells. And the recently, in such a situation, uh, we used the double room catheter. So double room catheter is used for to the uh, second rewiring. For example, uh, first rewiring wire is uh, proximal cell. So I, I, on I use the uh, double room catheter on the first wire, and the next wire is the distal cell. Try to distal cell. If the uh, wires were different cells, the double catheter cannot advance over the side mount. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank it you. was very good the presentation. <laughs> then we are going back to a classical question. What are the best imaging criteria for adequate stent expansion and apposition in a bifurcation lesion by Dr. Amadou? Dr. Amadoulo. Hmm? Okay. We don't know if he's there. Okay, while we are trying to figure out uh, that situation, maybe we can move to uh, Dr. Yamawaki, and uh, the topic uh, will be impact of bifurcation angle on incomplete stent apposition. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to present my other slide. So the, we, we previously proposed the classification of the rewiring position and the jail side branch configuration. And uh, also the Dr. Nagoshi uh, presented the previous uh, abstract. So that we uh, previously reported that the link free and distal wiring is associated with a lower rate of the instant, uh, incomplete stent apposition after the kissing balloon inflation. So the purpose of the present study is to investigate the impact of the link-free and distal rewiring condition and the bifurcation angle of nine-month OCT finding after single stand with final kissing balloon inflation. This study is the follow-up data of the 3 d OCT bifurcation registry already published uh, two years ago by Dr. Okamura. And uh, the, the total of the 59 patients could underwent the nine months of follow-up OCT, OCT, and we divided the, the link free and the distal wiring condition and the non uh, LSD condition. And in individual groups, that we uh, divided uh, uh, two groups such as uh, the high angle and the low angle, and for comparison. So the in this registry, the Every slot was, uh, 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 sorry, this is a previous slide, <laughs> not update. The I leave the my slide. Uh, uh, okay, okay, this is a <laughs> not update. But the, the every slot was uh, serially con counted on each frame at bifurcation and one millimeter interval, the five millimeter proximal main vessel and distal in collaboratory. So the in this study, the, uh, we defined the uh, bifurcation angle between the uh, side branch and the distal main vessel, and uh, we divided the two groups 
and we selected the median of the 55 degrees, high and low angle. The item, item to evaluate it in this study was shown here. The OCT analysis in co-laboratory included in completed center position immediately after PCI, nine months of follow-up, and also anterior thrust and nine months of follow-up, and the interval uh, evenness score at nine months of follow-up they calculated the, the mean uh, neo intimacy thickness and the ma maximum neo intimacy thickness, and, and the uh, clinical outcome at nine months. In region backgrounds, there are no difference between uh, limb free and distal wiring uh, condition group and the other. <coughs> and we look at the, the region the background, uh, we just registered the resonant interpretation was included at the 13 to the 40 cases. And uh, the, the rate of the flow bifurcation in the LSD condition is significantly higher than those of the non-LSD condition. We look at the procedure, the background, uh, there are no difference between two groups regarding the stent implant, uh, implant uh, at stent, uh, stent and the three ring platform or the pod technique. And in this registry, the cross wiring attempt for side branch is uh, one or two times and is almost safe. And uh, the, the, the radiation times a little bit longer in the LSD group. Uh, than the non LSD group, but uh, there are no differences between two groups in terms of the contrast uh, amount. The we look at the uh, link free and the distal wiring and the other. The immediately after the PCI, and we look at the side branch ostium and distal main vessel. The LSD condition is significantly lower rate of the in stent, stent incomplete stent operation than non LSD uh, condition. However, the after nine months, the follow up OCT demonstrates that the in terms of the distal main vessel, uh, the it uh, uh, improves and uh, the well approach, uh, well, well coverage, and side branch ostium. Uh, the both groups, the incorporate the attention they remain. However, the LSD condition is significantly lower rate of the ISTA. We look at the uncovered slot side branch, and the LSD condition is significantly lower rate compared to the non LSD group. And the average of the neo intimum and evenness score, the LSD group is a lower rate, so the homogeneous coverage can get uh, by using the LSD condition. We looked at the uh, bifurcation angle. Uh, it just slides show the LSD only the LSD condition group. Then when we look at the comparison between the angulation, the uh, higher angle is significantly uh, is associated with the malware position in the counter side of the side branches, uh, in the opposite side branch and distal main vessel compared to the lower angle. This is uh, the message in this slide. However, after nine months, the ISA improved and well coverage in both groups in terms of the main vessel. However, when look at the non LSD group, the we can see the data co uh, variation or dispersion could be seen in both groups and uh, there are no difference between two groups. And uh, uh, in both higher rate, but the also this group the is uh, uh, improved after nine months, but no difference between two groups. When we perform the multiple regression analysis to determine the predictor of the incomplete stent operation efficacy and for a positive finding at side band ostium and distal main vessel, only link free at carina was associated the lower rate of the uh, OCT finding. However, the uh, angle, uh, uh, the bifurcation angle did not uh, 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 did not uh, did not be a, a predictor of the OCT finding. The, the clinical uh, outcome in nine months is uh, no difference between <coughs> two groups, but the, the rate of the list of notes is a significant, uh, little bit uh, higher in the non LSD group. So the I want to propose the clinical implication of the OCT guidance for optimal kissing balloon technique in this study. 
when after the cross server staging and cross and the op operator uh, decide to perform the site branch intervention, the 3D OCT a, a imaging is a very useful for uh, uh, decide a decision. I think if the operator find the link free at Savina and uh, the link cross the this wire and uh, the we can get to the optimal decision. But if the operator find a no link, uh, uh, sorry, link is on the Carina or side branch, the I don't know the answer about the finish without the kissing or try to disturb wiring. And maybe they is associated to a uh, suboptimal kissing. I don't know, but this uh, result will be a answered by the next new uh, 3D OCT bifurcation registry now going study. So uh, the conclusion is shown here. High bifurcation angle should be care due to uncorrected stent distortion on the opposite side of the side branch and disturbing base cell by side branch use for final kissing by manipulation, in, in especially in the LFD uh, condition. But incomplete center position in main vessel decreased after nine months. The impact of the bifurcation angle was the minor than those of the link-free rewiring position before kissing in this registry. Final kissing by manipulation with optimal condition under the 3 d OCT guidance reduced uneven uh, intimal proliferation, the ISA, and uncovered the threat after nine months. The further studies required to demonstrate the clinical impact of the guidance by vacation treatment. Thank you for your kind attention. Any questions for the speaker? Yes. How did you measure your undulation by angio, by imaging, by OCT? Uh, no, no, it's uh, only the angiogram. So the uh, only angio be between the side branch and the distal main cell. Other question? So I think the same remark, I mean, uh, we have uh, reached the stage where we have uh, good imaging with uh, 20 micron resolution and then we have so different pattern that at some time we will have in the lab some kind of program to make an advance what we have to do because now it's the uh, flair of the physician to say, I think I will do this, and it's all uh, trial and error, so we need some uh, little bit more science, and then we'll be okay and so to see yeah. exactly what cell we have to, to uh, dilate and how predictable it is. Yeah, Thank I, you. I agree. If then, no more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Continue with the next presentation by Dr. Okamura. He's going to present algorithm when to perform imaging to optimize efficiency in OCT. OCT. Yep. Thank you for chairman. Uh, today my topic is our algorithm when to perform imaging uh, to optimize effi uh, efficiency. Uh, also, I'd like to talk about how to overcome OCT uh, limitation. Uh, this is the old one. Uh, uh, this slide shows the uh, comparison of IBUS versus uh, OCT in bifurcation treatment. Uh, almost items are, comparab uh, are comparable, I think. The, uh, the the uh, largest advantage of OCT is uh, to guide the, uh, able to guide the position of the guide wire recrossing point towards the side branch using the 3D OCT. Uh, whereas the assessment uh, ostium and uh, increasing uh, contrast media are uh, uh, major limitation of the OCT. This is a sequence of OCT acquisition to optimize uh, single stent strategy with side branch dilatation. I uh, usually uh, uh, Obtain the OCT pullback at the pre uh, procedure and uh, uh, from the main vessel and uh, during the PCI uh, uh, <coughs> to assess the guide wire crossing position and the final assessment. Uh, there, uh, there is a uh, following challenges. Uh, one is uh, uh, left main osteo marking and a reduction of number of attempts for the direct guide wire into optimal cell and the reduction of the contrast volume used. 
In the pull procedure, pull, pull back, uh, as uh, previous speaker mentioned, uh, sizing of the stent, uh, length, uh, decision of landing zone, uh, pre uh, prediction of the side branch compromise, and the ease of region modification, etc., uh, can, uh, can be uh, measured. However, the uh, uh, assessment of the ostium is difficult. In the current op European guidelines for myocardial revascularization, OCT is not considered for left wing intervention, whereas uh, IBAS is recommended as cross class 2A for this indication. Guideline uh, extension casita has a, a translucent tip. Uh, when I uh, put the guide, uh, tip of the guideline uh, uh, around the uh, uh, around the ostium, uh, we can uh, see the uh, uh, <coughs> ostium uh, through the guideline tip. So although detailed evaluation of left main ostium is difficult, uh, left main ostial marking on angiography uh, may be feasible. This is another op uh, alternative option for left main ostial marking. So additional guide wire is positioned in the aorta to avoid the cannulation of the uh, guide catheter beyond the ostium. Use, angio uh, uh, use co-registration, co uh, angiography, and OCT. I think the slow pullback would be recommended, and the contrast injection starts at more than four millimeter per second for of the plus rate uh, when the optical lens approaches to the ostium. Optical lens, uh, location of the optical, optical lens uh, indicates the uh, uh, position of the uh, ostium. So, uh, during the stent implantation, uh, guidance of position of the guide wire towards the side branch uh, uh, in the 3D OCT image is a um, major uh, uh, advantage of OCT. Dr. Onuma uh, uh, presented the uh, result of the optimum study uh, last year of PCR. Optimum study uh, is a much center randomized trial to investigate the whether uh, 3D OCT guidance uh, can uh, de decrease the incomplete center vision at bifurcation segment uh, compared to angular guidance. Uh, optimum study uh, showed the 3D o OFDI guidance was superior to angular guidance in acute incomplete center position uh, bifurcation segment. So, plate, um, uh, my plate is a uh, guide wire uh, uh, under floor peak guidance uh, like that. However, the, uh, uh, some reports uh, showed the, uh, 35 to 45 percent of cases needed uh, uh, second attempt because of the uh, guide wire located in the uh, not optimal self. Uh, thi in this case, I, sorry, uh, I put the stent meter LED and uh, uh, crossing over the diagonal branch and put uh, insert the uh, second guide wire into the uh, dead, uh, diagonal uh, this direction of the angiography. But unfortunately, uh, guide wire recrossed to the uh, lateral side of the sm uh, distal small cell. So second attempt, uh, a little bit uh, more array of view. Uh, so uh, uh, guide wire inserted the uh, dead side branch. Uh, uh, 3D OCT reviewed the uh, 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 proximate uh, uh, decrossing. So I want to uh, see that uh, this direction, uh, but the uh, uh, actual direction is like that. When we use the direction of the overlap between two vessels, the direction of the angiography, 2D and 3D OCT can be matched. So, uh, so in this view, uh, we can understand the uh, optimal cell located at the uh, lower side of the first uh, uh, Decrossing the guide wire. So using that view, uh, I put the uh, guide wire uh, to the blue circle. Uh, in the third attempt, uh, 3D OCT reviewed clearly revealed the uh, successful uh, distal decrossing. So usually uh, we uh, obtain the three or four times OCT accretion during the uh, uh, procedure. However, the, uh, we need uh, additional pullback uh, for uh, confirmation of the reviring 
and uh, if I uh, see the uh, stent malabsorption and uh, stent under expansion in the post procedure, uh, so we need a more uh, additional pullback. So uh, <coughs> the contrast volume uh, used uh, in the uh, uh, during the uh, OCT uh, guided PCI is uh, significantly uh, more uh, higher than uh, IBUS guidance. Uh, is that is uh, 30 milliliter higher than IBUS. So uh, cases underwent uh, Dekistram based OCT uh, guided PCI was being reported. So in this case, uh, I put the uh, I uh, 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 I put the stent uh, to the uh, left main to the uh, LCX with gel balloon technique, uh, and then uh, pot was performed. Then uh, recrossing the guide wire to the gel uh, side branch, and the uh, assessment of the position of the guide wire into LED by 3D OCT with the kiss run. Uh, three, uh, 3D OCT with the is uh, may be feasible. <laughs> In this accurate stenting, uh, uh, total of the nine pullbacks of OCT uh, performed. However, the contrast volume used was uh, uh, 97 milliliter, uh, uh, including the uh, diagonal sphincter angiography. So far, uh, uh, <laughs> we used the uh, uh, the kiss run uh, instead of the contrast for uh, flashing material uh, in our hospital, uh, total amount of the contrast uh, in the, the kiss run based uh, OCT acquisition uh, significantly reduced the uh, amount of the contrast uh, compared to the contrast based OCT. So in summary, a quick procedure OCT assessment is the main vessel provides useful information for bifurcation stenting. However, OCT assessment is fundamentally impossible. A potential disadvantage compared to IBUS and more contrast media is used. Some ingenuities uh, may overcome them. The biggest advantage of OCT compared to IBUS would be the guidance of the position of the guide wire into the gel side branch when the side branch dilatation is performed. Further studies whether OCT guidance for optimal uh, guide wire decrossing can improve clinical outcomes would be needed. Thank you for your attention. Any question from the panel, from the chairman or for the audience? Uh, according to you, what is the most minimum amount of OCT runs that you would recommend? After wire crossing first? Uh, first for mm. plaque characterization, second after wire crossing, and third final? Three. Uh, three, yes. Uh, pre uh, procedure and uh, uh, after wire decrossing and final assessment. So, la next question. Have you had any problems with uh, dextran use during OCT? Mm. Hypotension. Uh, sometimes uh, we cannot uh, clear the blood uh, from the lumen. Uh, uh, maybe uh, lack of uh, less uh, lack uh, vis less viscosity uh, than uh, contrast material. Any difference in creatinine between the dextron and the contrast medium? Uh, in our study, no difference bet uh, between no the difference. contrast and dextron because uh, uh, in dextron group, we uh, uh, use the contrast mo uh, about um, uh, approximately 100 millimeter, milliliters. And at, at the beginning, you showed, sorry, at the beginning, you showed the difficulty to uh, imaging the uh, ostium of the left main with OCT, yep. you know that. Uh, what what what's going to happen when you will have the hybrid IVUS OCT catheter? How do you see uh, the impact on the bifurcation field? Mm. <laughs> when Taka say mm, that <laughs> means something, yeah. <laughs> I can tell you. It's a difficult question. Um, I just clearly uh, saw the. Uh, uh, mm, uh, clearly show the uh, stenosis uh, of the osteo, uh, but uh, OCT maybe uh, cannot evaluate the uh, uh, plaque morphology. Uh, but you, the, uh, you, you would like to have both simultaneously. 
Uh, I, I like uh, uh, IBUS, but uh, uh, if I want to use the OTT uh, for uh, confirmation of the reclosing point, um, yeah. uh, we cannot use uh, both. So I, I chose the uh, OTT for uh, buffer case. Any more questions? Yeah, last year we discussed with Patrick this problem of using this <laughs> imaging, especially for left main, it would be very helpful, I think. Because this is the situation that you know you can try, but if you go out with the guidelines, then the you know contact detection is not effective, and even on, on your pictures, you know, the image quality for the assessment of the ostial left main or proximal left main was poor. And the first problem is, of course, rewiring is important. But then, if you uh, do not see the stent distortion in the left main, is the bigger problem. And this is why we also use intravascular imaging to mm -hmm. be really sure that the stent expansion in the ostium is proper and the stent is not destroyed by the guidelines. Mm, I, 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 I completely agree with you. But uh, uh, usually I, 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 uh, uh, I do the pot uh, more than 4.5 millimeter balloon, uh, uh, maybe larger balloon uses. Mm. Maybe I can say just a short audience to the audience a short uh, um, history about you. When uh, Taka came into our lab, the first job he received from me was on each cross section to measure the position of the struts because I could not understand why the struts were clustered in one place and, and very separate in the other place. And he did the job, he measured the the incidence, the prevalence, the angle, et cetera, et cetera, make curve of it. Until one morning, he came with a 3D pictures, the first 3D pictures of OCT that I have ever seen, and I could see that all this cluster of the struts on a single cross-section was just a positioning of the catheter, has nothing to do with the reality. That's Takao Kamura. That's, uh, the father of the 3D OCT. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Robert. <laughs> That's a 2008 <laughs> history. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Now we go to the last talk of this session. Dr. Onuma, he will speak on Optimum. It's a randomized trial evaluating online 3D OFDI guided PCI versus angiography in bifurcation. Thank you for the introduction. So, uh, um, so this uh, randomized study was actually a collaboration of uh, previous speaker, uh, uh, Takao Kamura, and the Japanese investigators with the European uh, academic team. Um, as a background, I think already uh, mentioned with, with the by the uh, previous speakers that the in bifurcating PCI reclosing of a distal cell with the wire after main vessel stenting is important to avoid creating the uh, de novo metallic uh, carina as you seen in this, uh, oh, sorry, in this uh, cartoon in the left hand side, that can also create the uh, uh, disturbance in the macro saturation uh, expressed in the shear rate in this uh, lower panel. And if you have uh, a metallic carina, you will have uh, some uh, kind of the um, predisposing uh, um, condition to the thrombus. So uh, um, the feasibility of the offline 3D OC OFDI was uh, demonstrated in the registry, but However, the feasibility and the efficacy of uh, online 3D OFDI during the procedure uh, has not yet been fully investigated. So, uh, um, yeah, this picture was already shown, but uh, uh, the objective of this randomized control trial was to determine whether the bifurcation PCI guided by online 3D OFDI is superior to bifurcation PCI with the conventional angiographic guidance in terms of the incomplete uh, center position in bifurcation segment. Just to mention the uh, uh, center position of a bifurcation segment, in usual uh, studies, uh, the bifurcation segment is ex 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 excluded from the uh, incomplete center position analysis, but in this trial, we specifically look into this incomplete center position in the bifurcation segment in the conference of the uh, um, um, so the, uh, <coughs> two, two, two vessels. So the design was a randomized control trial, mouse center uh, open level uh, prospective, the recruitment was done in the uh, in Japanese institutions, and uh, uh, um, data was analyzed in the in Europe. The primary endpoint was uh, post procedure percentage of the Marapose strut assessed by OFDI in bifurcation segment, and the major eligibility criteria was a patient with uh, uh, bifurcation 
uh, lesion um, and uh, planned uh, one stem strategy. So we excluded the complex one, but uh, mainly it was uh, simple uh, uh, bifurcation lesions with uh, side branch uh, um, greater than 2.0 millimeter in diameter and planned one stem strategy. So this was a study organization that uh, uh, you see that Taka is also the one of the uh, uh, primary uh, principal investigators and we collaborated with uh, 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 mainly the uh, uh, ex-fellows uh, uh, from uh, uh, um, Rotterdam and we collaborate uh, with the academic team so that some of the analysis was done uh, in uh, Europe but uh, mainly the recruitment of the case was done in the four Japanese centers. And uh, a grand giver was Telmo and the sample size calculation was based on the uh, um, previous publication and we assumed that the malaposition rate in bifurcation by angiographic violence was a 26% and using the OFDI during the procedure it will be reduced by 50% so the assumed rate of the uh, malaposition in the uh, OFDI violence arm was a 13% uh, and uh, with the using the standard deviation of 20% we came up with a number of the 106 subjects to be included uh, also taking into consideration the uh, attrition rate of uh, 5%. And uh, uh, already mentioned that we look into the specifically this bifurcation segment in this figure and look into the mara position in this uh, place. So uh, this was the randomization scheme. So uh, a patient undergoes the uh, uh, PCI in the bifurcation, uh, single stent strategy. So uh, our master stent was implanted in the main branch. After that, POT was mandatory. So the uh, all, all cases, uh, proximal optimization technique was uh, performed with non compliant balloon. And if you are randomized to the treated OFDI arm, then OFDI is performed to look into the uh, position of the guide wire. Also, we classify the uh, configuration of the uh, stent strut in front of the side branch. So the carina uh, uh, link free or link uh, um, um, a present uh, configuration is there, uh, type A, B, C, and we will show that the division uh, later on. Uh, but uh, depending on this uh, uh, position or the uh, configuration of the strut, we decided the uh, optimal uh, 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 point of the recrossing point, it's not always the most distal one, but if there's a link in front of the uh, rim, distal rim of the ostium, we, we, we go for, the, we went for the second distal cell uh, because you cannot really eliminate all these uh, metallic structures. <coughs> so uh, uh, in the three of FDI guidance, if the optimal uh, cell configuration recrossing point was not achieved in the first attempt, then second attempt or third attempt was performed to, to uh, confirm that uh, uh, recrossing point is optimal. And after the uh, kissing balloon, the final OFDI, wise, uh, OFDI was performed in both arm to, to for the documentary uh, uh, reason, because the primary endpoint was acute uh, incomplete center position at this bifurcation segment. So baseline characteristic was uh, quite well balanced. You can really see that there's a no difference. Uh, these are the procedural characteristics. Uh, uh, we majority of the case was LAD or the left main. I think left main was uh, a really small portion. Only the seven cases was uh, le uh, left main. So majority was non-left main cases. And I have to say that the Merina classification uh, was uh, uh, less complex. Uh, 111 or 011 was only the 10% uh, or the 14%. And, uh, but I think the uh, other point is the POT was performed in almost all cases, 98% of the case in both arms, uh, uh, proximal optimization technique was uh, performed. <coughs> well, this is the case of the angioguided PCI, so uh, uh, left main bifurcation was treated with the ultimaster stent, and you can really see that uh, after the POT, there was a rewiring and uh, a kissing balloon was performed. And the final OFDI was performed to, to look at the uh, MARA position at bifurcation. And that was sh showing that the, uh, actually the wire was taking the proximal cells. So even after the uh, 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 kissing barrel, you s really see that one ring is uh, protruding into the uh, bifurcation of the left main. The second case is uh, from, uh, this is uh, yeah, this case, so angiogastric PCI. In the cross section, you really see that there's a lot of uh, uh, clustering of the struts in front of the bifurcation in this uh, bifurcation segment. So in this case, ESA was uh, treat 34%. This is a, a case of the OFDI guidance PCI. So the first attempt are performed, and after the rewiring, the uh, OFDI was performed to see the, the, the uh, position is okay or not. But you can really see that the uh, recrossing wire is in the proximal position. So we want to go for the distal position. 
The second attempt was performed, and then uh, 3D OFDA was repeated, and the uh, uh, second OFDA showed that actually the recrossing wire is now in the optimal position in the distal uh, cells. Then a uh, kissing balloon was performed, and the uh, final result was uh, quite uh, nice without any metallic uh, structures in front of the Taiwan protein. So uh, in this case, the optimal uh, result was achieved by this uh, 3D OFDA guidance. So in this case, if you look at the cross sections of this uh, bifurcated segment, there was uh, just one strut uh, marrow pose, but otherwise uh, there's uh, no metallic structures in this uh, bifurcation segment. So this is a, a primary endpoint in complete center position at bifurcation, but significantly lower with the 3D OFDI guidance, 19.5% versus 27% in the angio guidance. So uh, superiority of this 3D OFDI guidance was achieved in terms of the reduction of the uh, uh, incomplete center position in the bifurcation segment compared to the angio-guided PCI. Uh, if you look at the details, so in the 3D OFDI guidance arm, the uh, uh, feasibility of the online 3D OFDI was 98%. So definitely we can use this uh, 3D OFDI during the procedure using the uh, console. Uh, recrossing the um, um, wire was uh, required uh, in 45%. So. Uh, in other words, 55% of the case, if you put to the pot and uh, rewired, uh, already it was uh, optimal. But in 45%, you have to do this uh, uh, recrossing again because the wire position was not uh, optimal. And uh, if you look at the, the, the attempt, number of the attempts in this OFDI arm, so the 55%, it just uh, uh, shows that already for the first attempt, the uh, uh, recrossing point was optimal, but uh, uh, in the list of the cases, 45% of the cases, the uh, second attempt or third attempt was performed. Uh, in second attempt, 13% of the cases was achieved the optimal composition, but for the 32%, you need a three times or four times uh, attempt to achieve the optimal configuration. But uh, there's uh, some uh, running curve, so uh, this, uh, 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 cases with uh, a greater number of the OFDI proper for attempt was uh, uh, in the beginning of the recruitment. And if you look at the uh, uh, also the contrast volume used in these uh, two arms, there was uh, not so much difference. Probably it's also influenced by the fact that the on Nanju arm, there is also the usage of the OFDI for the documentation purpose. And you can really see that configuration of the uh, no ring at Tarina or ring at Tarina or uh, ring at Tarina with or without link. So uh, you can really see that uh, in the previous classification, probably the link-free uh, configuration is 59%, uh, this configuration A and C, and uh, in 40% of the cases, 39% of the cases, there was a link in front of the side one. So anyway, you cannot really achieve the uh, a complete uh, um, 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 elimination of metallic structure. And there was a significant difference in terms of the ESA uh, according to this uh, configuration, which is really difficult to control because uh, already when you sent the uh, uh, main vessel, uh, the, this configuration was decided. So uh, uh, I think the, uh, probably that's probably not controllable during the procedure. So these are the secondary uh, OFDI endpoints in terms of quantification or lumen or the mara position area and uh, stent area and the flow area. There was uh, no difference uh, in terms of the uh, this quantity quantitative uh, OFDI endpoint uh, between these two arm uh, if you take into account all the segment including bifurcation. So as a conclusion that the, uh, uh, in this uh, randomized control trial, the uh, 3D uh, OFDI guidance was superior to the uh, angio guidance in terms of acute uh, uh, stent uh, mara position in the bifurcation segment. And uh, feasibility of the online uh, 3D OFDI guidance was uh, excellent, 98%. So after mandatory port, even after mandatory port, the first wiring position was not optimal in 45% of the cases, uh, requiring the second attempt to redirect the wire into the optimal cell when 3D OFDI guidance was used. Uh, online 3D OFDI images uh, help operator to undergo the uh, rewiring to the optimal cell, resulting in uh, a lower rate of the mana position compared with the angiography guided PCI. Of course, we need to see the long-term outcome, how this uh, uh, improvement in acute uh, stent mara position is uh, related to the long-term outcome. Thank you for attention. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hanuma, for this excellent talk. Uh, most of these uh, diagrams and pictures that you have shown are with the stent design, and that's where, where what Professor said last time. 
doesn't it all depend on the stem design here it's a peak to peak connection which is directly connected now if you have a connector between your peak to peak design does this change yeah i, I think uh, you're right i mean in in this uh, for example uh, design stems which have these yes. connectors versus you know the the resolute type which you know do not have the connector so in this uh, um, trial we only use the ultimaster so this there's a only one design but if you have uh, for example a, a valid value or the different type of the link probably the uh, configuration will be different and uh, you know as i mentioned that it's probably not controllable how the configuration of the stent is for the first place uh, uh, after the membrane stent. So that's probably the difficult part to control. But uh, according to this uh, different configuration, we could uh, change the position of the wire. And I think the optimal position of wire is probably different uh, by type of the stent. Th this remind me a little bit the story of the uh, coverage of the struts. I mean, we spend a lot of time, of course, Renew your money on a table of Topsy had uh, a very high denominator, and uh, it seems that uh, non coverage was really related to uh, thrombosis. But we at Clinician had a hard time to translate any numbers of non coverage in stent thrombose. And the question here is it was not too difficult to calculate the power calculation and sample size to prove with a p-value of 0, 0, 008 and uh, 17 versus 25. But how do you see, how do you going to translate that information in the clinical information, in the sense that around the world there is a few people doing that. Um, if I have a poor suggestion, I said try to create big data with long-term follow-up. Otherwise, it could be a, another exercise in futility in the sense that you have beautiful image, you have proof mechanically that something is going on and, and clearly there is a, a morphology which is superior to another, but what is the uh, translation clinical event? I mean, any ID and how many patients you will need to do that and how long you will have to follow them? Yeah, uh, so I think of course the, the one logical uh, uh, forward s step is uh, to conduct a randomized control trial uh, without mechanical uh, um, interpretation, but with the clinical follow-up or outcome as a primary endpoint. So you can probably uh, design the study between the comparing the angio guidance versus the three the OFT guidance without looking at the OFT after the procedure, but just looking to the uh, uh, clinical uh, outcomes in this population. And um, I think the, uh, the the sample size would be something like a thousand or the two thousand or three thousand. So you need uh, some uh, a large number of the patient to do so. The other idea is maybe for for example in this series you can follow up the patient in the long term. And previously we have seen that uh, it was a bioreservoir scaffold, but uh, there was uh, some kind of the uh, membrane. Uh, uh, created between the strut and the limb of the ostium. And I think that same things can happen in the metallic stem. So if you remain the, uh, uh, put the metallic structure in front of the side branch, that should happen uh, at certain points. So uh, maybe the long-term uh, uh, imaging follow-up of such population might be uh, some, some uh, give, give us some uh, uh, insight into what's we going on. We saw this morning a beautiful uh, talk this on that yeah. uh, in this. Did you see a presence of thrombus in the malaposis stent as compared with the wellaposis strut? Sorry. Yeah. So uh, this this in this series, it's it's only the uh, acute uh, observation. So we didn't see the uh, thrombus uh, only in the very limited cases. But um, maybe we need uh, some time to, to see that if the thrombus is developed or not, because I think the shear stress is very low behind the uh, strut in front of the side branch. So if you do the some follow-up, imaging follow-up, maybe we could see the some difference. A short technical, technical question. You mentioned that only 98% of patients had a POT in your study. So can you explain us why 2% of your patients did not have POT? It was because of technical problems or it was because it was suggested by your uh, imaging result of 
something else? Yeah, it was uh, uh, just a technical problem. They could not really cross the, the balloon into the stent and uh, they, they could not achieve the port uh, according to the protocol. So there's only one cases per each arm that, uh, that the operator could not perform the port. Thank you very much. I think that uh, concludes this very interesting session. Big applause for all the speakers. And uh, according to the program, I think we have to move to another room, if I understand well. But the lady maybe would tell us, yeah. interest of time, let's uh, move on to the next session, uh, bifurcation and regulating balloons. Could I just, uh, could I please invite the chairperson and the moderator to please join the podium? Dr. Sardela, Dr. Sikik, Dr. Kinoshita, Dr. Sudarshan, Dr. Silva Marquis, Dr. Kanik, and Dr. Fatuj.
the first slide please good afternoon everyone i would like to first uh, thank the organizers of uh, and the board member of the ebc club to introduce this new session and thank you all for coming this is a new born session drug role of drug eluting balloons in bifurcation uh, coronary angioplasty so we've got a very experienced group of speakers here to touch on various aspects could you put my slides please uh, could somebody put the introduction slides please So this session is dedicated to uh, uh, role of uh, drug eluting balloons in uh, coronary bifurcation uh, treatment. Obviously, as you all know, uh, coronary bifurcations are common. Could you put uh, this, uh, the, the first uh, slide, Rathor, for this session, please? Yes, so, so this, is, uh, this session is dedicated to bifurcation drug-eluting balloon. Just uh, a couple of minutes for the introduction. Uh, as you all know, the bifurcation lesions are common, seen in about uh, 10 to 15% of the cases. And the significant side branches, which are more than 2.5 millimeter in diameter, or uh, uh, inducing at least 10% of ischemia, or by other methods detected uh, uh, responsible for more than 10% of ischemia are relevant. In left main stem, 90% of the side branches are relevant to be treated. In non-left main stem, it's about 20% of the side branch are relevant. In left anterior descending coronary artery, that is diagonal, about 30% of the side branch are relevant, and uh, about 25% circumflex coronary artery. Now, provisional strategy has better outcomes than the preferred strat strategy recommended by EBC, and the major uh, randomized trials and meta-analysis has shown the better outcomes with provisional strategy. However, there are slightly higher rates of uh, side branch occlusion or side branch restenosis and sometimes the adverse outcome in the main branch. Now, kissing balloon inflation in one stand strategy is quite variable uh, in provisional strategy is seen in around 30 to 40 percent of the cases and usually done if the side branch uh, stenosis is more than 70 percent or there's a reduced flow after the main vessel stenting or if there is a live side branch to keep the side branch open. Now, if you look at some contemporary data from COBIS 1 and 2 registry, there are better outcomes shown. However, it is still controversial that kissing balloon angioplasty in one stent strategy reduces TLR in main vessel uh, due to increased MLD proximal in the main vessel and also uh, better outcomes in the side branch. And then there was, a there, was a, there was a study, SMART strategy 2, left main stem bifurcation study, which has shown the binary stenosis at the side branch is better with kissing balloon angioplasty in non-true bifurcation, which is 10.9 versus 23%. And in true bifurcation, it's up to 40%, the side branch restenosis. So side branch restenosis is a significant problem with conventional uh, treatment strategies in large side branch. And there are other studies which have shown that higher side branch intervention at follow-up in two-stand strategy. And th there have been several studies, some uh, randomized studies, some uh, uh, some other studies looking at the impact of uh, drug eluting balloons in provisional strategy on the side branch and they have shown uh, quite uh, that this is quite feasible with current uh, generation of drug eluting stand to use current generation of drug coated balloon to the side branch and this can further improve the outcomes in complex bifurcation lesions if we adapt a strategy of main vessel stenting and uh, side branch balloon strategy. So now uh, we are going to have a presentation uh, on different uh, issues, uh, looking into this, looking into different uh, drug eluting balloon uh, uh, 
uh, technology uh, and the current uh, contemporary data with regulating balloon technology in the bifurcation region in some case scenarios. So first of all, I would like to welcome uh, Deity Pruvalik to come and give his talk on existing recorded balloon technology. And I just want to request all the speakers to keep up to 10 minutes as we're running a little bit short of time. Thank you. Thank you, Rakore. Thank you. It's a privilege and an honor for me to be here. Uh, my name is J.T. Pervolovic. I came from Croatia. And my talk will be uh, about existing drug coating technology. some uh, obvious and theoretical advantages of drug coating balloons over the stents, but after the 13 years uh, after the first uh, published uh, randomized trial uh, with drug coating balloons, some of us are still skeptical about it. There are enthusiastic sticks of doctors, just a bon aventura. <laughs> But most of us uh, use the drug balloons when we are not confident to put the stents in the region. And these are the data from uh, three years ago. And we can see that uh, about two or three percent of procedures uh, are finished with drug coating balloons in Europe. Uh, there are lots of drug coating balloons with C mark for coronary intervention with the Pactus Axel. Same dose, two to three, mostly on the semi compliant balloon, but differences in uh, excipients. And I think that's uh, very important at the beginning to, to emphasize that there is no class effect. There are data for it, and in this data from real wa world large registry from Sweden, we, we can see the uh, major differences between restenosis between two balloons used in one in, in 1,100 patients. In uh, every subgroup, including the bifurcations, and the bifurcations uh, was indication in 20% of uh, 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 balloons, uh, the drug use in balloon. So, and this is another example uh, Dr. Cortese pointed out in uh, um, uh, ECT this year. The difference is between Picolet try one when he used the Paclitaxel balloon for the first generation with the spray without excipients and a lot of drugs were uh, lost during the manipulation and the results, uh, the negative results of course, and the positive uh, results in small vessel with a new generation drug coating balloon that uh, have a high Pactitaxel resistance in a vessel wall. So that's the obvious that excipients is probably have the direct impact of Pactitaxel uh, pharmacokinetics that is it is most important. But there are some other uh, components that influence the performance of drug coating balloon. Let's say drug morphology because uh, the crystal armor for another forms of uh, coating could uh, uh, have the uh, uh, impact on solubility or retention of the drug and penetration in the wall or crack, uh, fragility in downstream particle lo loss. So coating methodology could uh, influence our uh, results deep micropipette spray coating with the, which is probably the best, or coating geometry uh, in, uh, let's say, uh, in folded balloons like umbrella uh, could be probably different than the new one with the red balloon and highly elastic wrap around that could influence all the uh, performance of the balloons. So we want uh, from the industry to have a no bulky device with all the, the best things that could be done. Uniform coating, no farm limitation, minimal handling damage, low transit loss, no local toxic event, fast uptake and retention of the drug in the wall, and at the smallest dose uh, that is effective. 
then uh, another thing that to discuss is the drug. Uh, there is a, a solid clinical based evidence for the drug eluting stem that the, that the, the Tyrolimus is be better than Papetaxel, but we don't know is it true for the drug coating balloons. Mode of, of action is completely different. Papetel cell is cytotoxic because he works in a M mitosis where the cell divides and uh, the cell death due to uh, apoptosis is likely to occur even in a therapeutic doses. So the window therapeutic, therapeutic range is narrow for the papetal cell and the opposite is uh, for the Tyrolimus. They do the same job with a small cell pro pro proliferation and migration and the telecell proliferation, but the tissue absorption is fast and retention short for papetal cell, just the opposite for the Tyrolimus. So uh, what we will expect from the industry, we would like to then to resolve the problem uh, about the difficult uh, coating of the Tyrolimus because he's le less lipo lipophilic, so. And to tell, to give us the data about the balloons, very precise preclinical work we need to be uh, sure that uh, data from vitro, in, in vitro and vivo studies and uh, pharmacokinetics, histology studies, stage of the balloon, drug loss in the retention, Doses, uh, those uh, those studies for the uh, excipient and the drug uh, could uh, mm, uh, give us sure that the, the, the balloon is good. And clinical studies, uh, probably the best randomized trials and uh, good, good, good registries. And some data about um, existing serolimus balloons. First is magic touch. It has a, a carrier with hydrophilic and lipophilic tail, uh, tails that encapsulates Tyrolimus, which is nanoparticles, smooth outside and uh, allows the drug entry to the intima. Yeah, the data. I will skip the preclinical data, but I have to say that uh, Reno Birmani and Professor Sirius uh, were included in that uh, uh, investigations and go to the Eastbourne Registry, presented uh, by uh, primary investigators, Dr. Cortez and Colombo, this year, on 2,000 real-world patients, and uh, data uh, encouraging uh, uh, for the maize, yeast, uh, PC, uh, target lesion, the uh, revascularization, and NMR. Another device is uh, Solution, he has a micro reservoir of biodegradable polymer and uh, cell adherent technology that keeps it, keeps it. Uh, and uh, only one study, uh, including uh, patients uh, with in infant retinosis bifurcation and small lesions, comparing it to the Paquetax cell balloon. I don't know the data. And the Vitu angioplasty balloon, he uh, the device has a porous balloon and delivers serolimus in uh, liquid formulation. Only one study, 50 infant retinosis patients with a Leiferman loss in the range of uh, other non-fed techniques to, to treat the infant retinosis. And uh, uh, Bruno Scheller with, with his team tested three years ago uh, different crystal modifications, uh, modifications of course the coating and find that, that crystalline was the best one that ensure that uh, about 14% of the drug will be in the, uh, in the, in the wall and low, very low loss. And that resulted with a novel uh, sequent serolimus coating balloon from Brown. Uh, the data that I could found was only this uh, on fa 50 patients. Uh, comparing uh, in infant restenosis uh, novel, Seromus coating balloon with a second fleece, very established and probably the best one on the market. And there is uh, uh, almost the same late woman loss 
which is used probably tested in bigger trials. So at the end, I will say that drug coating balloons uh, are technology that involve toward the development of new delivery methods and new drugs. And we need uh, more of, of a large randomized clinical trials sufficient with sufficient statistical power to, de to detect at least non-inferiority compared to the best drug eluting stents for the broader application of this technology. Thank you. Great presentation. Just I'll just kick off with uh, one question. There are several uh, drug coated balloons are available in the market now. Uh, and is there any clear, obviously you've uh, touched on a few aspects, is there any difference in like their uh, um, any clinical event rates or uh, late loss or TLR with any specific balloon like Pachycel or, uh, or is it something to do with uh, how the drug is bound on the balloon? The only, the only one that I found, <laughs> I, pred I put in this presentation, and, uh, but head-to-head uh, -head com com uh, comparison, I, I don't know. There will be probably uh, with a uh, uh, new uh, film with Magic Touch, they have a in program comparing the new one with the, with the I don't know which one, uh, probably, uh, probably Magic, you know, Klaus, no? I think that if they will <coughs> compare Magic Touch with the, uh, what's the second case? Head to head, but uh, the only data for the scar registry and that points out that there is no, there is no uh, class effect. But just, just a comment. Uh, the drug coating balloon has been shown that it's effective in a normal vessel. The problem is uh, that the, the bifurcation lesion is a real challenge in setting. The problem is, I think, that the crossing, the struts, you can open another space. Because when you use a, a drug coating balloon in a, a regular vessel, or even in uh, instant stenosis, you don't have the same trauma of the, of, the, of the drug. You cannot lose the drug. Thus, I think that the real challenge setting is the bifurcation lesion to have a good results with drug coating balloon. And I agree with you when you say that use drug coating balloon if you cannot use drug eluting stent because I think yeah. it, it's a good message. And uh, the, the bifurcation is, uh, you know, there are two things about the bifurcation. Keep it short and simple. And uh, another point, uh, I, I, I think that it must be said that uh, if we have uh, uh, 10 million interventions in the world, Two million for bifurcations. We will probably have twenty percent of two million complex intervention. So, if we could do this simple procedure with a drug coating balloon inside brain, yes, then it could make completely but new we perspective. We cannot expect the same result in bifurcation issue with drug coating balloon as <coughs> in the in the normal vessel. I think we cannot expect. I will uh, look at the side branch as a native vessel. But the problem is the struts of the main branch. Yes, uh, you can treat it before the main vessel. That's my idea, and we can discuss it in, in a separate room later. Thank you very much for your uh, very nice presentation. It was really excellent. We don't have enough time, but uh, we can discuss about it uh, later <coughs> in the another room. So this is a very top, I think, uh, um, situation with uh, lots of uh, difficulties uh, how to use and which kind of balloon we should use. So we will go to the another lecturer and it will be Dr. Araya and he will tell us something about the bifurcation lesions and maybe we will have some answers for the previous uh, uh, lesion. Thank you very much. Matt Mix from the Miss Chairman. Uh, I'm representing here the newborn Latin bifurcation team, so I appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much. Uh, next, please. Oh, yes. So nothing to disclose. So um, in guidelines, uh, we don't have any mention about uh, the use of drug code balloons uh, in the European guidelines or even in the consensus of EDC. There's no statement at all of use of drug code balloons. Um, 
I, I, I made an extensive uh, review in the literature since uh, 2008. I select only dedicated papers on the use of drug cord balloons in bifurcation treatment uh, with more than 20 patients, and I can find 600 patients with the novo bifurcation treated with this technology, and also 350 patients treated uh, with a restenosis uh, of a bifurcation treatment before. Of course, we are speaking about different balloon technology in many uh, papers. So four strategies are tested in these uh, trials uh, that are presented here. The first one is drug coat balloon plus uh, bare metal stent. And uh, let's get into the, the data. The PET cap 5 trial in 2011 studied 28 patients in single arm dual set registry. They use the second please paclitaxel drug coat balloon. And the strategy is predilatation with uh, drug eluting balloons, drug coat balloons in the side branch and in the main branch, and then uh, go through uh, stenting the main branch with the BMS. They choose the Coroflex. And then post dilatation of the side branch with a semi compliant balloon. Uh, they don't report the diameter of the side branch. Uh, the true bifurcation incidence is 71, and uh, bailout stenting in the side branch after finishing the procedure was in 14 percent. Uh, they um, they uh, said that the side branch late loss was 0 0.21, and in the main branch 0 0.38. So they conclude that with this uh, strategy, they have less like results in angio control at nine months, uh, but in the clinical outcome, they has uh, two patients with late stent thrombosis, so they have more than expected le less late stent thrombosis in the main branch. The second uh, paper about uh, using of, of drug code balloon with BMS is the registry of the debut trial. It's the first uh, communication of this group. 20 patients, pre-dilatation, they use the Dior 1 balloon, the old uh, one uh, Dior balloon. Uh, they use it in the side branch, and then they put a BMS in the main branch, and they, they follow the patients clinically, and they, they report no MACE or no TLR at four months. That, that trial uh, makes uh, the base to do a randomized trial, the debut trial, randomized trial in 2012. They have uh, 117 patients, and they randomize in three groups. The first one is use the depth uh, the drug code balloon Dior 1 uh, with a BMS. The second one is to use only a provisional T stenting with the BMS uh, Liberté. And the third uh, arm is to use a DES, a Taxus Liberté, as a provisional T stenting. Uh, they have a follow up with Anjo with a core lab at six months and clinical lab one year. Uh, there are some small differences in terms of side branch diameter between the groups. Favors in favor of a uh, drug eluting balloon, uh, the, the diameter of the side branch was 2.5, and the uh, bailout stenting is uh, in the range of 5 and 10 percent in the, in the groups, and the results uh, are disappointing to drug coat uh, balloon in this trial uh, using the Dior 1 balloon, because the DES group shows at the follow-up angio uh, late uh, luminal loss better and binary resinosis better than um, than the drug code balloon and BMS. Uh, it's not a uh, power for, for a statical difference, but uh, uh, the, 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 the numbers are there. So no benefit over BMS plus not con ba non code balloon. And of course, Dior 1 is less effective in drug release. That, that's why they change after this trial to Dior 2 technology. DES better and your clinical outcomes than the other arms. And a, s a second randomized trial, uh, 2014, every intervention is called Babylon trial. Uh, it randomized 100 patients, 108 patients to um, uh, the use of drug code balloon, the sequence please, a BMS and a DS, science B, Everolimus. All the patients in the drug code balloon arms uh, must be predilat with predilatation with normal balloons and then use the sequence please in both branches and then stent in the uh, main branch uh, with BMS. BMS. Um, the through bifurcation, through bifurcation is 78 and 80 percent. The side branch diameter is uh, 2.29 and 2.35. Uh, Kissing balloon is uh, at uh, operator's uh, discretion and is very low. 
in both arms, 15 and 35 percent. And the results of these uh, randomized trials are these. They show that in main branch, uh, the, the, the use of drug coat balloons plus bare metal stands is worse, of course, than DES. But in the side branch, the late, the late luminal loss is uh, quite good in both, uh, in both arms. Even they has a negative results. That means that the, 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 the side branch gets a little bit bigger in the angiogram and uh, 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 the follow-up. Uh, they, they, they have a very low maze uh, uh, percentage in the DES uh, group. And the risk stenosis in the side branch in the drug code balloon is 5.8 versus 3.6 in the DES. So they conclude that Everolimus DES is better than drug code balloon, but in the main branch, but in the side branch, the results in both uh, branches are quite good. So the second scenario is use drug code balloon and DES. And we have uh, here some trials that uh, I want to show you. The DEPSA trial in 2015, uh, they used 50 patients. Uh, it's a registry using the DES Nile packs. It's a dedicated stent to bifurcation, uh, for bifurcation lesion, a polymer free abluminal coated with uh, acrylic cell stents. And they use as a drug coat balloon the Danubio balloon. Uh, it's a paclitaxel coat balloon. Uh, they, they follow 50 patients. The side branch diameter is very small, 1.84. And the true, bifur true bifurcation is uh, 64%. They report no bailout stent in the side branch after using this strategy. And the late loss in the side branch with this strategy using the DES plus the Danubio at the side branch is 0.04. It's a very nice result in the side branch. And the TLR in the side branch is, is reported at 5%, so they conclude excellent result in side branch. Not so good in the stent because they have TLR of 10% with this uh, dedicated stent. Then uh, Errador uh, in 2013 um, makes this registry also, 100 patients. They compare 50 consecutive patients treated with Taxus plus uh, Dragalutin balloon sequence please versus uh, conventional treatment of a bifurcation with the taxus uh, um, uh, with a balloon normal balloon um, the true bifurcation is 64 the mandatory kissing balloon and ibus uh, it's very low uh, in this uh, in this trial the bailout stenting is 10 percent for using the drug code balloon and four percent in the taxus arm and the results at least the um, TLR in the drug code balloon is 12%, and in the plain balloon, using the same stem, the, the same dragalutin stem, the taxus is 22. Uh, and there, there is a, 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 an important difference in the late luminal loss in the side branch, 0 0.09 versus 0 0.4. Uh, and in the IBUS analysis in the, in the, in the follow-up, also there is a big difference uh, favoring uh, drug code balloon, so they conclude that five branch treatment with the sequence please show better angiographic in terms of reduced late loss and better minimal lumen diameter with a tendency to lower also binary restenosis. And then the Biolux one trial, they, they, they test the use of uh, drug code balloon Pantera Lux, also Paclitaxel, and they use in the main branch to have Everiolimus uh, DES. They have to predilatation both branches and uh, put the drug code balloon in the side branch and the DES in the main branch. They use, uh, after that, kissing balloon with normal semi-compliant balloons. They also have angiographic follow-up at nine months. Uh, the side branch diameter is very small, 2.01, uh, and bailout stenting uh, with DES was reported in 11%. And the results are that late lumen loss in the side branch using this uh, Pantera Lux balloon with the Everolimus stent is 0 0.1, and even in the IBUS uh, analysis of the side branch also has very nice results. No restenosis, no angina follow-up, and the composite endpoint is 5.9, so they conclude that the combination using the Science B or Science Prime DES in main branch and Pantera Lux, drug coat balloon in the side branch, appears to be a safe, effective, and a novel treatment option for bifurcation lesions with low, low late lumen loss in the main and in the side branch. Finally, the Sarpedon trial shows uh, a comparison um, after after they put a drug stand in the main branch, if they have a pinching in the side branch, 
the ghost with kissing balloon and then to use the Pantera looks uh, also black coat balloon in the side branch. So the, the inclusion was after putting the DEF in the main branch. They have also angiocontrol axis in between six and nine months and they report late lumen loss in the side branch 0 0.09 0 0.09 millimeters and restenosis in the side branch of 6%. So they conclude also an excellent result combining DES in main branch and red coat balloon, red coat balloon in side branch when you have a pinching after uh, provisional technique. Finally, they, I have to report red coat balloon only strategy. These are uh, very interesting uh, and, and provocative strategy. And we have here free communications, Dr. Schulz, 39 patients, red coat balloon only strategy with sequence please. They has uh, one fair patients with left main treatment in bifurcation treatment without no stent at all. They have to pre-dilatation, pre of course, with a scoring balloon or high pressure balloon. And the results are uh, quite good. They have a stenosis in the main branch of 6.7 and side branch 3.3. TLR in two patients. And maize 7.7%, 7 .7%, no thrombosis at all. So they report that this strategy is safe and effective even in, in left main bifurcation. There is a registry of 127 patients published by BRAC in 2016 that they also report uh, very nice results with red coat balloon strategy uh, only. Uh, in this uh, trial, they treat all the patients with um, dilatation with uh, red coat balloon. And if they have to put a stent, they put a bare metal stent in 47% of the patients. And the results in the red coat balloon only patients are very nice with a TLR at nine months of 4.5. And finally, a PEPCA beef trial is a randomized trial it's a very interesting trial. Uh, they use sequent please as an only strategy after predilatation. They, they do the predilatation with normal balloons and then they use red coat balloon. And then uh, randomize the red coat balloon and, and do a follow up at nine months and they use, and they, they use uh, the sequent please and they show a very nice results in the red coat balloon uh, follow up with l uh, late lumen loss of 0 0.5. 13 versus 0 0.5 in the normal balloon. So they conclude that is a nice strategy. So um, finally, Beatriz Vaquerizo shows uh, the use of drug code balloons when you have a Medina 0 0.01 bifurcation. Most of them are osteal diagonal stenosis. They show the late lumen loss of 0 0.3 and rest stenosis of 22. She, she will show, I think, the data next. I will. Uh, move uh, to this data of uh, restenosis because because I see Dr. Fernando Alfonso here who will probably talk about the, this data. And there is only one meta-analysis, so this is my last slide, one meta-analysis of using of drug coat balloon in bifurcation treatment comparing with uh, plain uh, angioplasty in the side branch. And they show in uh, 2018 that they have better results with drug coat balloon in terms of late lumen loss in the side branch. That was the only difference between two groups. So where, would this, where, we, where do we stand now? Uh, I think we need more data. The trials of bifurcation treatments use different protocols, different device, small trials, no pot, low percentage of kissing balloons, so no state-of-the-art bifurcation treatment. Only paclitaxel coat balloons were reported. In general, the use of Paclitaxel drug coat appear to be effective and safe in the, safe in the side branch. The use it with bare metal stasis is, is not recommended, it's inferior to DES, and the uses with Everolimus DES show excellent results. And provocative uh, conclusion, the only drug coat balloon strategy may be feasible and safe. So thank you very much. Yeah, nice uh, presentation and quite uh, exhaustive uh, overview of all literature. In interest of time, we'll move on. We will have discussion uh, later on. So could I now invite Dr. Alfonso? He's going to talk about the uh, role of drug-coated balloon in uh, instant restenosis. Okay, so... First of all, thank you very much. It is a pleasure for me to be here in this important uh, European Bifurcation Club. I'm not an expert in bifurcation, so 
thank you very much for the invitation. So for the last 20 years, we have been uh, studying different strategies in patients with stenosis, stenosis, as you can see here. And recently, we just concentrated in the use of drug coating balloon in these patients. And there are several strategies, uh, apart from drug uh, coating balloon, uh, with the idea of leaving nothing behind, behind in this patient that already got a, a, a metal label. So that uh, let me share with you some data from the RIPS studies. These were studies for patients with stenosis stenosis performed in 25 academic uh, sites in Spain. And basically, uh, a RIS-5 was a randomized study in patients with bare metal in stenosis stenosis. Uh, in this study, we found very good late angiography results with drug coating balloons, but even better results were obtained with the use of uh, erbenolimifilipinostein in these patients. As you can see here, the primary endpoint of the study was minimal long diameter at follow-up. And this translated into a marginal yet significant uh, uh, difference in favor of erbenolimifilipinostein regarding uh, TLR. In the, most, uh, the more complex and challenging setting of patients with drug diluting in stenosis stenosis, as you can see here, again, in these four, we compare everolimus lupin stem with drug coating balloons. And again, the uh, minimal lumen diameter of follow-up was improved after the use of everolimus lupin stem. Uh, in this, again, translated into a significantly lower rate of uh, TLR during late follow-up. So if we just concentrate in results obtained in the RIS studies with conventional uh, plain old balloon angioplasty. You can see that, that the lane loss is 0 0.7, 0 0.8, uh, and the lane loss that we obtain with drug balloon is uh, less than 0.2 in patients with bare metal stenosis and 0.3 in patients with uh, drug eluting stenosis. So, yes, drug uh, eluting, stem, uh, eluting balloons are effective in these patients and significantly reduce late loss as compared with balloon angioplasty. This is very recent data coming from the group from uh, Munich, and you can see the Dedalus trial. This is uh, uh, probably the largest studies in uh, the largest studies in patients with stenosis. stenosis. You can see here, this is a patient level analysis uh, of 10 randomized clinical trials in patients with stenosis, stenosis putting together nearly 2,000 patients. So here, the, uh, the endpoint of target lesion revascularization was significantly reduced with the use of new generation drug looping stems as compared with uh, drug coated balloons, as you can see here. And this was mainly the result obtained in patients with drug looping stem stenosis, the, more, the most challenging uh, subset, because in these patients, uh, uh, drug looping stems proved to be better. In patients with bare metal stem stenosis, the two strategies work very well. What about safety? So this is a safety endpoint, a combined endpoint, including death, MI, and vessel thrombosis. And you can see here that there are no difference between the two strategies. However, numerically, uh, drug coating balloons appear to be safer. But this was just, as you may see in the introduction study, the result of some events in the uh, First generation drug looping stems. Second generation drug looping stems in this setting are as safe as, dr as drug coating balloon as was demonstrated in this large study. So, what are the recommendations from the European guidelines? You may see here the in patients with stenosis stenosis, uh, either bare metal stenosis stenosis or drug looping stenosis stenosis, stenosis, the two strategies drug coating balloons and also second generation, new generation drug looping stems got a 1A recommendation. And I think it's important also to emphasize that the guidelines suggest the value of intracoronary imaging to optimize the results of these patients. So we got the two strategies. When we should use them? Use them. Well, this is not very clear. There are many investigators that will say that when there is already uh, several metal layers, well, perhaps it's better to, uh, to avoid you know, implanting a new, a new stent, a new permanent uh, metal layer. In patients with a high bleeding risk, well, it will, you know, it will seem safer perhaps to use drug coating balloons to reduce the time of fluorine to prevent therapy. And there are some investigators that always use for the first stenosis a drug coating ba balloon with the idea 
that if the patient come back with a recurrence, we can then use a, a drug lipinister. But uh, still, this is not based on data. A major issue here, uh, theoretically, is the uh, presence of a major bifurcation. Here, obviously, trying to avoid further metal in this jelly, this branch, or jelly, the, this uh, bifurcation uh, is very attractive, but there is very little data in this regard. Some years ago, we performed a study uh, assessing the fate of branches uh, uh, taking off, emerging from uh, uh, in stem restenosis that were treated. So there were 100 consecutive uh, patients with in stem restenosis, but please notice that in, in general, these were minor side branches because these were patients included in the studies. So that in this study, the outcome was very good. There was a 10% of angiographic uh, occlusion of uh, small branches in general, and only 2% of patients developed myocardial infarction. Uh, we performed systematic angiographic uh, follow-up in these patients, and the vast majority of patients eventually, the, the branch was, was open a follow-up as occurred in other settings. Uh, and we uh, try to predict uh, what factors could influence that the we had an occlusion or a flow deterioration in a side branch in a patient with a in stem restenosis. So that we found that when the branch uh, was occluded during initial stem implantation, when the branch had osteal disease or a compromised flow, in general scenarios as diuretics of diffuse in stem restenosis, they these were factors that affected the outcome of these side branches. But again, I want to stress that most of these side branches were small. So uh, we've been uh, listening to the value of drug coating balloon for patients with uh, uh, bifurcations without a prior stent. I just uh, uh, selected this uh, recent meta-analysis, uh, putting together three randomized clinical trials, very small, one the Babylon in Spain, the debut that we discussed previously, and also the pet, pet cat bifurcation. So if we put all this data together, uh, there is no uh, clear signal of a, a clinical benefit, but there is a, a quite clear uh, message regarding the late bloom and loss. When we use a drug coating balloon in the side branch, uh, then the late bloom and loss uh, is reduced as compared with conventional balloon angioplasty. This is the pe pet cap beef uh, trial uh, that, uh, again, in this is rather small uh, trial, you can see 25 patients per arm, uh, the lay lumen loss was significantly reduced uh, in the in the group subgroup of patients randomized to Dracotin balloon as compared with FOBA. We also heard about the value of addressing the whole bifurcation without stents. Well, we know that provisional stenting is the recommended strategy, but what about not using stent stents at all? Well, this is a registry, it's a, but a relatively large registry. When they try to follow this strategy, then you can see that in 55% uh, of the cases, they were able to finish the result uh, of the bifurcation without implant implanting any additional metal. And in one third of the cases, they eventually finish with the stenting in the main branch. And with this strategy, the clinical results uh, were very good according to these investigators. So this is probably uh, the only study that will be addressing the question I was asked, uh, what about treating true uh, uh, restenosis, true bifurcation occurring in restenosis with major branches? There is very little, little uh, information in this regard, but this is pa uh, a paper coming from the group of uh, uh, Anna Castrati again, and you can see 177 patients presenting with in stem restenosis after the bifurcation was treated with a, uh, a double stem technique. So will major bifurcations where a two stem strategy was required? Well, uh, as you can see here, the binary restenosis rate using drug coating balloons alone was 24% and eventually the mains rate was also 24%. And as you may see, uh, the main narrowing was located uh, at the ostium of the side branch, but there was also some concentration in severe lesions at the distal part of the, uh, the bifurcation in the main vessel. And these are the results. 
uh, there, there were uh, no differences according to the uh, specific type of drug protein balloon uh, used. And this study is interesting because they also obtained systematic late angiographic follow-up, as you can see here, and also other technical issues as uh, final kissing balloon inflation uh, did not change the prognosis, the prognosis of this patient. So this is my last slide, just trying to be uh, kind of uh, provocative here. So this is a study for patients, again, with restenosis after treating left main bifurcation. And this is a small study from uh, China uh, comparing the use of drug eluting balloons alone versus uh, conventional drug eluting stem implantation. And it's a very, very small study, but they found that uh, cardiovascular mortality uh, was better when the use of a drug eluting balloon. Well, just uh, uh, a study kind of provocative, but very, very small. So I think my conclusion here will be uh, that both drug eluting stents and drug eluting balloons are uh, indicated for patients with in stent restenosis with good result. And you, you know, this uh, type 1A recommendation from the European Society of Cardiology. There is plenty of observational data and some randomized uh, uh, studies data suggesting the value of drug eluting balloon for bifurcation and it's very attractive to finish a provisional stent stenting strategy uh, when, uh, when the side branch need to be treated with a drug coating balloon, but data there is not so powerful, which is why it's not in the guidelines. I think when the uh, in stem restenosis encompasses a major side branch, well, then trying to finish the work with the drug eluting balloon alone strategy is very, very attractive, but obviously we need more evidence to identify the best strategy for this patient. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Fernando. We, we move to the next uh, speech, and then we, we come to for the, for the discussion later on. Dr. Vaccherizzo will show us some cases on uh, bifurcation 100, no? Dr. Vaccherizzo he, later. He, he's not here. Not here, okay. So we'll move uh, on to the next. Then, uh, Dr. Bonaventura for uh, bifurcation treatment without a stent. So, dear chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for inviting me to this amazing meeting. So, this is my disclosure. Ladies and gentlemen, we have new data for small vessel disease in the field of uh, DCB. We have the data from the Basket Small 2 trial, including more than 800 patients with small vessel disease, and they compared the strategy with the DCB sequence leads and the DES, and they started with the Taxis and they finished with the Science. And the primary endpoint was the outcome at 12 months with cardiac death, non-fatal MI, and target vessel revascularization, and there was no significant difference. So DCB was non-inferior to the use of a DES in this big cohort. We have data from the Bello trial. They included more than 180 patients with de novo descent and small vessel disease, and they compared the DCB with the Falcon Impact, compared with the Paxis Excel uh, eluting stent with the Taxus at that time. And the primary endpoint was late lumen loss at six months, and it was only 0.02 millimeters in the DCB group and 0.29 with significant difference in the DES group. We have the recently published Picoletto 2 trial, to include which included 232 patients, also with small vessel disease, and they compared the DCB, it was the Elutax SV, compared with the Science DES. And primary endpoint, again, was in segment or in lesion late lumen loss at six months. And it was significantly less with the DCB, 0.04 millimeters, compared to 0.17 with the DES. So in this study, DCB was superior to DES. What works in small vessels also works in larger vessels. Shown in this results from the Chinese Institute, they included more than almost 600 de novo lesions more than 200 lesions in larger vessels, and more than 373 lesions in small vessel disease. It was a clinical follow-up at 10 months, and as you can see, 
we have very low rates of MACE and PLR in the small vessel disease group and even better results in the larger vessel disease group. And when we look in details to those patients and there are 91 lesions with an angiographic follow-up, you see in both groups a positive remodeling with a luminal, late lumen loss of negative of minus 0.17 millimeters in the group of large vessel disease and of small vessel disease. Ladies and gentlemen, drug coated balloon allow for local drug delivery. So lesion preparation is magic. Lesion preparation is a big step, is mandatory for the use of DCB. In the ISA Desire 4 trial, they included 250 patients and they compared the approach with a scoring plus DCB versus standard balloon angioplasty for lesion preparation plus DCB. And as you can see, the primary endpoint was the in segment percentage diameter stenosis at the six to eight month angiographic follow up. It was significantly lower when the lesion preparation was done with a scoring balloon instead of a conventional balloon angioplasty prior to the use of a DCB. But as we all know, in the world of bifurcation lesion, one and one does not mean it's two. So it's difficult to transfer this da these data in the world of the bifurcation lesion. But at least there are several potential advantages to use the DCB also in bifurcation lesion. We have a 100% lesion coverage. We have no multiple layers. We have an easy lesion crossing for the side branches. We have a reduced duration for the DAPT. And finally, we have a, an a important part. We have a reduced risk of carina shift or aggregation of a side branch osteal lesion. So multiple potential advantages. But as mentioned, be as mentioned before in the, in the talks, most studies that we presented today so far they include the stenting of the main branch. And for good reasons. We have a huge variation of technical and anatomical variations. We have the already mentioned peptide diff trial. They included 64 patients with the novel lesion and bifurcation lesions and compared the DCB versus the POBA and only in three different types of bifurcation lesions. No surprise, the late lumen loss was significantly lower in the DCB group with only 0.13 millimeters compared to the POBA. And no surprise, binary stenosis rate was lower in the DCB group with only 5.6% versus 26% with the POBA. So primary endpoint was significantly lower, but what does it mean when the competitor was the POBA? And we have the International Registry for the Treatment of Bifurcations. They included a significant number of patients, 127 with de novo lesions, including side prints of at least two millimeters. They compared DCB only with DCB plus 10. And as shown before, there was no significant difference in the clinical outcome. But when we look at those patients suitable for DCB only strategy, PLR was only 5.6% and MACE was 6.2% and not any single composite event. We have the recommendation from the German consensus group. Because, it, because it's very complex, I go to this step by step. In patients with only a lesion in the side branch, it is simple and we follow the, the recommendation from the noble, the, the noble lesions in non-bifurcation lesions. We start with the lesion preparation and if the cuticide is acceptable, it does mean we have a no relevant dissection, no normal PME flow and residual lesion of less than 30 or 40% then we use the DCB in the side branch. And it's quite comparable with the main branch. If there's only a lesion in the main branch, we make the lesion preparation in the main branch. If the cuticide is acceptable, we finish with the DCB. It's a little bit more complex with the true bifurcation. We use two wires for sure. We start with the lesion preparation in the side branch, followed by the lesion preparation in the main branch. If the cuticide is acceptable for both, we start first with the DCB in the side branch, then we use the DCB for the main branch. If there's a relevant dissection in both branches, we do what we did for the last 20 years. We are very familiar to treat this with one or two stand approach. If there, this might be a typical situation if there is a relevant dissection in the main branch and uh, an acceptable result in the side branch after lesion preparation, then we should first use the DCB for the side branch and then stand the main branch for two reasons. First. I want to achieve a circumferential contact with the drug at the ostium of the side branch prior to the use of the stent. And second, I want to avoid damage of the drug load on the DCB by crossing the stent strap. So from my personal experience, this algorithm for DCB and bifurcation lesion is safe and effective. 
we made that experience with this algorithm at the ostrum of the right coronary and the left main artery. In my opinion, there's no room for kissing DCB because it takes too much time, we lose drug, we have a reduced contact of, uh, of the drug coating at the vessel wall, and we have an increased risk to cause a severe vessel. I want to show you three cases. This is a female patient who came for elective intervention of the obtuse marginal branch. She had a positive stress test uh, caused by this uh, lesion at the obtuse marginal branch. We started with lesion preparation. It's an 001 situation. And after lesion preparation with a 2.515 millimeter, I think it's an acceptable result for lesion preparation. So I treated this with 2.520 DCB, two to three millimeters longer on both sides. And this is the final result after lesion preparation and DCB only. I think in the world of DCB, it's a perfect result. We left it like this and the lady came back four months later and we see the positive the lumen enlargement and uh, the positive remodeling. The second case, this 50-year-old lady, she came with a positive stress test for the anterior wall. In the R review, you might agree it's a moderate lesion, but in the lateral review, you see it's an eccentric, high created lesion. So I started with lesion preparation. It's a 3.015. And this is the result after lesion preparation. This is not a DES-like result, but it's an acceptable result for lesion preparation. And I treated this with a DCB. It's 3.020. And this is the final result in the latter view. You might agree it's not an optimal result. It's in a residual lesion of maybe 30 or 40%. I left it like this, and this is the final result in the area of view, and this is the follow-up at six months, at four months in the latter view, and by chance the lady came back four and a half years later, and we still have this amazing long-term result. My last case is a female patient. She is 84 years old. She came with unstable angina, and she had this 101 situation. And uh, we treated this first with a, as you can see, it's an osteo lesion also at the diagonal branch. I started with lesion preparation in the main branch. It's 3.513 scoring balloon, then 2.513 for the diagonal branch. This is the result after lesion preparation for both branches. It's an acceptable result for lesion preparation. So therefore, first DCB for the side branch, 2.520, and another 3.520 for the LAD. This is an acceptable result after DCB only. I left it like this, this is the final result. And the lady came back, this is the final result in the latter view again. And the lady came back, by the way, it was yesterday morning, and this was the long-term result after three months. And the latter view, it's a perfect result. So my last slide, DCB showed proven efficacy and safety in instant restenosis and de novo lesions, especially small vessel disease. So lesion preparation is essential for DCB treatment and might be more challenging, as we discussed before, in bifurcation lesions. Data from small trials and individual experiences support the use of the DCB in bifurcations, but we are missing the one and only or the big bifurcation study. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. That was a great uh, presentation. Uh, could you comment on uh, uh, lesion preparation, uh, like what kind of lesion preparation you want to do before uh, if you're using drug-coated balloon or drug diluting balloon as a primary strategy, and how important well, it is? I think we're completely, it's completely free to, uh, the, to, to choose the best available uh, tool. Um, my personal uh, or favorite is uh, to use the scoring balloon, uh, especially in more less or more calcified lesions, but we're using high-pressure balloons uh, as well. I think a normal compliant is might be also appropriate. At the end, before we before we use the DCB, we have to achieve the best possible lesion preparation, and any tool might be useful. Suggest rotablator in uh, in these cases. Sorry, you don't suggest rotablator in these cases. So we better. also suggest a rotablation. We did a lot of cases with rotablation uh, with a small burr followed by finer size scoring followed by DCB only. Good. Uh, any any comments? Uh, any questions from the from the other panel member, please. I have one one question with uh, lesion preparation. When you are very elective, as you said, uh, sometimes you have dissection. Do you leave it like that, or you always put the stent in the in the instant? Well, we leave dissections up to a grade of. B, definitely, and up to a grade type C, if, the, if there's a normal flow and the uh, patient is free of chest pain, we leave it without the stand, right. And I, I have another question, uh, because we, we have seen the great images of, uh, of angiographic images of what happens with the vessel after 
to the tip to those with balloons. But um, do you have also information about the intravascular imaging in these cases? What is happening in the in the vessel? We have, we have. Uh, for lack of, uh, uh, say, uh, for time consumption, uh, I uh, didn't show any case. But uh, we did a lot of uh, studies with, with imaging, and sometimes, uh, to be honest, uh, it's confusing. Definitely because we see a lot of dissection. But nevertheless, there is no algorithm saying if you see this result at the OCT and you see a type B dissection in the OCT or type C dissection, uh, you have to use uh, a stent. But what we see with time is this huge improvement and what we, our experience was that we can trust in the angiographic result and there is no difference in our decision making whether we use the DCB after the use of the, uh, the, the do the OCT after the use of the D uh, DCB or not. I have just one short question. So uh, the drug uh, will not, uh, I think, uh, work on the calcification. So do you use uh, some technique uh, to uh, find out what kind of the disease is uh, beyond that uh, uh, bifurcation? And uh, uh, do you uh, what is really strategy to, to take on that drug eluting balloons or the drug eluting stents? Mm. Uh, this uh, is this, uh, very important. We have poor information what happens with the drug in uh, more calcified lesions. There is one preclinical trial in atherosclerotic rabbits showing that there is an impact of the calcification on the drug load, but with higher pressures, and, and this was the, the cutoff in this, again, in this study, atherosclerotic study in, 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 in rabbits, was two atmospheres. So higher atmospheres at the with the DCB guaranteed enough drug transfer into the vessel wall. I think it's a matter of lesion preparation. And what we uh, see is that we if we achieve a significant plaque modification and uh, lesion preparation, we, we it seems to be that we have enough drug transfer to uh, guarantee these results as in less classified lesions. What we ha also have seen is that we have not this positive remodeling. We have the same, quite the same late doom loss, but we do not see the positive remodeling in the more calcified lesions, but we see comparable low rates of late doom loss in more calcified lesions. Well, that's a good, uh, I think the drug coated balloon can be effective for not just for the osteal side branch lesion, but the lesion extending into the side branch also, a few millimeter could be effective. Two more questions from the audience, one from Eve and then from Tom. So my question is for both you, Klaus, and for also for Dr. Alfonso. Uh, we have been proposed a, a scoring drug eluting balloon by Philips. It was two years ago, I think. Uh, we had discussed uh, yesterday, uh, last year, to build uh, some uh, some study to have data because they want to sell, but they have not data. So do you think this is a good idea or not? Drug eluting scoring balloon. Drug eluting scoring balloon. Mm -hmm. We uh, also participated in the first and men's study with the, uh, the drug coated angioscope, by the way. And honestly speaking, I think it's not the, the best approach. I think we should invest time and, and tools in the best, uh, best possible lesion preparation. And then we decide whether we need the stand or we, we use the DCB. Uh, we, we mix the two concepts, if we, and we, we should do this with a final size balloon, in my opinion, at least a balloon to rest ratio of 0.8 to 1.0. If we, our approach is first with a, with a final size DCB or drug coated uh, scoring balloon, um, this will not work because we will create a lot, of, uh, a lot of situations where we need an additional stenting afterwards, in my opinion. Yeah, thank you very much. I think, uh, I mean, there is data on devices like this. One is published by Bruno Scheller, and there are also other devices. Uh, we have uh, used some of them in Spain. Uh, my personal experience is that when you need to have, you know, the right balloon, the right length, and, and this can be tricky. In theory, this is a good strategy, but I don't see a problem to use any scoring balloon you can use with your uh, drug eluting balloon. The other issue is that the only study that has proved that or values that, even though uh, theoretically it's very attractive, is the result uh, of the size called by Robert Berman. Uh, do you perform a kind of different study in terms of different stainless steel lenses that we call this six scoring, where we use another strategy of leave nothing behind that was BDS at that time, and when we compare BDS, standard BDS implantation after fibrillation, with scoring balloon and then BDS implantation, and this difference value, uh, 
the scoring of this method, you know, you were unable to see those dots. So, I mean, in theory is very attractive, but we need more data in, in the, uh, let's say, clinical setting in this part for patients where we need to cover the sizes of the devices and the method. Okay, brief comment from Tom here, and then we move on. Okay, could you uh, thank you very much, thank yeah. you. In the interest of time, let's move on to the next presentation. Uh, by Dr. Chico. He's going to talk about uh, potential uh, scenarios for studies with drug coated balloon and bifurcation uh, coronary artery lesion. And after this talk, we will have some, uh, some voting. We have got some questions uh, for the audience. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the invitation. It's always a, a pleasure. I think we have seen an overwhelming amount of data. This is a very boring talk, but we'll try to do it very provocative. So I'm going to present as uh, proved statements some um, provocative questions just to consider if we are planning to do a bifurcation study in, uh, with drug coated balloons. Uh, so first consideration we have to have in mind, and Dr. Pulovic already mentioned it, that there is no class effect. We could replicate the same study design with a different balloon and maybe expect different results because the technology is different and there is clearly no class effect. Second consideration is, is that it's very important to do an adequate use of the drug coated balloon. In aggressive plaque preparation, as we have mentioned, we have to keep in mind that we have to uh, keep a very short transient time, less than uh, three minutes, ideally, and uh, for instance, this is one of the drawbacks of combining the angioscout uh, the scoring balloon with the drug coated balloon. Probably our transit time will increase because there are bulky devices that probably will not cross and we will uh, spoil the technology. Uh, and also allow uh, enough transfer time, more than 30, ideally 60 seconds. And that's why I think for a study, the left main could be a very challenging scenario. I've seen some cases in the morning I've seen data from Chinese uh, studies, but really, do you want to occlude the left main with a drug coated balloon for 60 seconds? I think this could be very challenging if we are planning some, some study. This is something to consider. Um, something which is my perception, and is against the German consensus, is that maybe the drug coated balloon should be the last device in a coronary vessel. We are going to use that to treat whatever. Um, <coughs> One example is this study that we published using OCT. So we were using the OCT. And if we look, the binary restenosis was much higher than in the previous PIPCAT study. And if you look, uh, it was even higher in the group that used the drug coated balloon first. It was a combination of drug coated balloon plus bare metal stent. You can say, well, it can be uh, incidental, it's not significant, but we have also this study that has been already presented by Dr. Araya, which is the uh, Babylon randomized trial. And uh, um, so basically it was a combination of drug coated balloon plus bare metal stent or conventional balloon plus drug gluten stent. Notice how the restenosis in the side branch was more or less the same in both groups but the restenosis in the main uh, branch, in the main vessel, was higher in the group that used uh, the drug uh, coated balloon, followed by the scratching of the bare metal stem. So this might play a role, and maybe the adequate technique, the adequate way to use the drug coated balloons is using that as last device and then letting it in peace. No imaging, no other uh, intervention, including post dilation. But this is something which is my personal perception. Another thing, and I hope that professor agrees because I learned that uh, from, uh, uh, from him, is that maybe late lumen loss is not the best end point for drug coated balloons because late lumen loss was intended or was meant to compare one stent versus another stent because it's a very good surrogate for the neointimal hyperplasia. But it can be misleading uh, in other scenarios, particularly in comparing stent versus balloon. And I'm presenting the data from the Ben stent trial in which for the first time a stent proved that the restenosis was significantly lower than with plain angioplasty. But if we look at the late lumen loss, it was higher in the stent group because the gain was also higher. The more you gain, the more you will lose. So maybe late lumen loss can be a misleading endpoint if we are aiming for that. 
And finally, I think this is the only one you will agree, we have to choose a, re a relevant site branch. If we plan our study for these site branches, but our investigators enroll these site branches, then we will have ruined our study. I mean, if we have an irrelevant site branch, your study, uh, this will have no impact on your study, irrespective whether your uh, technique or your device is good or bad. So, uh, if we have to figure out some scenarios, it's impossible to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 present here all of them, but let's present four of them. The first scenario is a Nordic 3-like scenario. Uh, as, you they <coughs> as you know, it compared final piece in balloon versus no final piece balloon in provisional stenting. It was using the cipher, Sirolimo uh, <coughs> saluting uh, stent, and they found no clinical difference. Notice how low uh, event rate we had in both groups. And but for instance, if we look at the angiographic endpoints in the side branch, uh, the binary restenosis was significantly lower if we were using final piece in balloon, especially in true bifurcations. And uh, how often were these bifurcations? Well, it was half of the of the patients involved. So. Why is there this discrepancy between the angiography and the, and the clinical results? Maybe it's because the uh, side branches were not relevant. This is something that we cannot know. This is uh, just speculation. What about uh, using uh, drug UT balloon as final piece of balloon? This is something that has been already presented here. Uh, this is an observational study, but apparently regarding the restenosis, then it's a sli slightly lower and the late lumen loss, of course, is much lower than in the Nordic study. So it might be potentially useful. Um, if we go for this hypothesis of uh, using in true bifurcations with a minimal meaningful side branch, the drug coated uh, balloon uh, in final piece in balloon, uh, we could have the assumption that the, uh, the, um, this strategy would be as good as final piece in balloon in Nordic and using an angiographic endpoint of side branch restenosis, eventually we could guide it also by physiology, by FFR or any other surrogate. Uh, using these uh, incidents of uh, events, we would need a, a number of 324 patients, including 10% uh, uh, loss per follow-up. This is probably the most convenient design. If we are more ambitious and we want a clinical endpoint, this is probably more meaningful. Maybe we can go to this BBC One like scenario. Uh, you know that it compared two stents and provisional stent uh, using the Taxus um, stent, and it was the endpoint was similar to the patient oriented oriented composite endpoint, and provisional stenting was clearly better in this uh, clinical endpoint. Um, True bifurcations were 82 percent. However, uh, if we go to China now with the new stent, the VK crash, uh, we have learned. Uh, Professor Shaban is also here. He presented this data last year. In uh, complex bifurcations, uh, <coughs> the VK crash two stents technique might be better than provisional. In hospital, there is less maze, and at one year there is less cardiac death. And what is defined as complex bifurcation? It is more than 10 millimeters. Uh, stenosis severity, but there is a list of minor criteria that uh, make a bifurcation also complex. So, second scenario would be this hypothesis that in complex lesions, like the ones in definition, using a strategy of provisional stenting plus kissing with drug coated balloon might be superior to two stents techniques. If we do these assumptions, uh, for instance, uh, let's say for the sake of time we will go quickly about this. Uh, we would need a sample size of 761 patients, including 10% uh, follow-up. A third scenario, maybe more innovative and stemming from BBC, was using the uh, report technique. This has this is being tested clinical right now, so there, there are no data, and I guess you probably know uh, all this uh, technique. Uh, this could be a probably a good idea to do a pilot study of provisional versus a uh, report using drug coated balloon in the side branch. But there is some other group here in the EBC which is uh, going one step further. They are proposing report dot also with distal optimization technique. And maybe I don't know how they uh, are doing this or how do they suggest. I hope you are commenting right now. 
but maybe a good idea would be using this uh, bottle balloon from Bautzen. So for these strategies, uh, uh, report and report dot, we could do the same assumption as we did in the Nordic free trial using an angiographic endpoint, and we would be in this scenario of needing 324 patients. Or we could go uh, for a clinical uh, endpoint like the one that we have described. And uh, in this case, we could maybe go for non-inferiority, but the numbers are prohibited. And if we go for the superiority uh, trial with clinical endpoint, we will be in 761 patients. In this case, there, there is some trick that maybe we can comment later about non-inferiority. So in conclusion, there are some considerations that we have to make clear before planning a study in a Dracotti balloon. And um, yeah, maybe we have to take them into consideration. We have uh, discussed them already. And there are se several possible scenarios. We have to choose between an angiographic endpoint, which is easier to achieve, or a more meaningful endpoint with clinical relevance that will be, of course, more um, uh, cost um, uh, will cost a, a bigger sample size. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you. That was a great presentation and overview of uh, potential studies with a coated balloon. Uh, uh, in the interest of time, if we move forward, uh, we've got some questions for uh, audience polling, if Benjamin is here. We can have that uh, polling now, just to get a feel from the audience about uh, the use of the coating balloon in bifurcation uh, situation. So I think the first question is, what percentage of provisional bifurcation stent do you perform kissing balloon inflation? Do you guys have polling? Well, if the polling thing is not working, we can have a bit of a show of hands to get a, get a feel. Uh, uh, so le less than 30%, who, 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 how many people in the audience do less than 30% uh, kissing balloon in provisional? And more than 50%? Well, it's not a scientific poll, but it looks like uh, majority people do more than 50%, so about around 50% if the side branch is meaningful. And similar result is shown upon this. Uh, so this is the second question. Do you routinely perform kissing balloon inflation in large side branch, which are more than 2.5 millimeters? So yes, for yes, uh, how many people in the audience? And no? So majority don't uh, routinely perform uh, kissing balloon inflation in the side branch unless uh, there's a clinical indication. Okay, let's go to the next question. But I'm not sure. Uh, what the question is clinically relevant side branch uh, restenosis. Maybe in a follow-up, uh, would you potentially treat it? I think we should go to the next question. Now this is important questions. Do you currently use drug coated balloon in side branch when performing kissing balloon inflation? In the patients you perform kissing balloon inflation, do you use drug eluting balloon in any of your cases? And if, uh, if you use less than 20%, anybody use more than 30%? So I use in, uh, obviously if, if it's a large branch, I routinely use drug coated balloon in the side branch. I, do, I don't have a follow up data for this, but if the, if the branch is more than 2.5 and clinically you are doing a kissing balloon and trying to improve the outcome, I try to use a uh, drug coated balloon at the final. So less than 20%, majority of the people will use. Uh, and uh, anybody in the audience will never use drug coated balloon in the side branch uh, after killing balloon inflation? So clearly, th that is a majority view. Uh, any other questions? Okay, so th these are the questions. So I think uh, to summarize, uh, um, obviously there is a potential role for a drug-coated balloon in large uh, side branch in provisional uh, uh, 
uh, bifurcation coronary artery stenting. Could you put my, my last slide? So obviously my, uh, my colleague has already discussed about the different uh, bifurcation DB trials which could be proposed. And there are different combination, whether in the provisional group you b use main vessel drug eluting stent followed by KBI pot as standard or in place of kissing balloon inflation, you use the drug coated balloon in the side branch. This is for provisional strategy or can, could also be potentially compared in complex uh, bifurcation lesion where you are intending to use two stent strategy to get away with just single stent strategy and use drug coated balloon in the side branch and achieve uh, good angiographic result. Obviously, there's a lot of discussion and interest uh, from the group in this area. So we have organized a meeting at 4.30 p.m. in the foyer, one of the rooms. So I would like to invite you all to come to that meeting. We will be presenting a survey of EBC, uh, all the EBC members. We've got about more than 60 or 70 people have replied back with the questionnaire about the potential views and how to take this forward and probably uh, test it in uh, some uh, trial uh, to look at the role for drug coolant balloon in uh, bifurcation PCI. Thank you. So I'll stop here now. If Eve would like to say a few words. Yes, we have a we have a room uh, that we, you can meet the one who want to participate to any initiative in the in the, uh, the topic of uh, drug eluting balloon for side branch or for the whole bifurcation. You have uh, half an hour during the, uh, the the coffee break in the afternoon. You will meet in a, in a small room which is just behind the boot of Medtronic in this uh, level. So I don't think you will have time to discuss uh, scientifically, but at least you will, you will know each other in order to build something uh, on, online on internet, to build uh, a trial or several trials or a registry, exactly what you want. But that is for next year. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you, Eve and uh, all the board members. Thank you, all the chairpersons and the panel members. So we'll uh, conclude this session now. And I would really want you to come and uh, attend this session and give your views about the coated balloon. Thank you.